Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Brightworks. Today, the much-awaited sequel, the Cortex Unit Thesaurus. Everything you've ever wanted to know about every unit, its role in the game, and much, much more presented to you in one admittedly long uh, video. Now, if uh, just like the other one, if you are looking for notes about a specific unit or a specific bot lab, uh, specific units that come out of specific labs. All of that will be documented down below. There will be timestamps. So if you want to jump straight to that lab, it'll be very obvious, but I'll explain the scheme once again as we jump into our first units. Now, let's get right into it. So you can see I've set up a wonderful display of all the units, and we're going to start, same place we started with in the last one, the Tier 1 Bot Lab. So the Tier 1 Bot Lab, probably the most common thing that Cortex players are going to start with, although Vehicles is probably a close second, but the Tier 1 Bot Lab, if we follow this trail, we can see all of the Tier 1 heroes that Cortex has available to them. Now, I'm going to do my best. I'm primarily an Armada player, but I'm going to tell you about what I know about Cortex and uh, give, you, give you the information that I have. I'm sure that there's going to be others that can leave comments down below with other, other helpful information about these units because I'm, I'm familiar with them, but not quite as familiar as the Armada kit. Now, getting right into it, the uh, important things to note, I'll explain this. Uh, if, you, if you are curious about the other video I'm referencing, it's called the Armada Unit Thesaurus. Another long video explaining all the units in the Armada kit. And uh, it goes over similar topics, but I'm going to explain the same thing that I explained in there. Each of these units has a card in the bottom left-hand corner there. And you can see that in the top left-hand corner of the card in the bottom left-hand corner, don't get confused now, stay with me. There's a little symbol. This symbol is shown on any of the units, and every unit has a some sort of symbol in this top left-hand corner of their, their little card, a little information card. That symbol, at, it's meant to tell you at a glance what this unit does. So starting out here, we have the Trasher, which is an amphibious anti-air bot. Cute little thing that kind of scurries around, has these, these adorable little legs. And in fact, you'll see that's a theme among many of the Cortex units. And it shoots these anti-air missiles out of its little front tusks, which uh, go up and, and destroy planes. And so, indeed, this purple triangle, if you see this on a unit, that means that this unit's primary role is as an anti-air uh, anti unit, anti-air ship, vehicle, uh, bot, whatever it is. So the Trasher. Uh, notes about it, it's amphibious, which means that it can go into the water, which is why I put it over here. And we'll see that move over there. And it also is a uh, anti-air bot. So it's a light anti-air bot, which means it's able to shoot down T1 ships with relative ease. It takes a few shots to take down a bomber, even less to take down a fighter, and probably one shot to take down a scout. Uh, you can see it scuttles across the bottom of the ocean floor with ease, just traversing as if it traversing it as if it was normal terrain. And we're going to bring this guy back. The the use cases for this, of course, would just be anytime you need anti-air, you can you can produce a few of these. 125 metal a piece. It's not bad. And oh, and another part of their card that I should probably mention is in the bottom right hand part of the card. You can see a little symbol, uh, sort of a drawing. That drawing is what you'll see when you zoom out to a high enough level. You can see, I'm not sure how well this will show up on the, the YouTube recording, but you can see that that symbol appears in place of where that unit is. So you can tell at a glance what your whole army is based on these symbols. So get familiar with those. And if you're, if you're curious about what a unit symbol is, you can just highlight it and see the unit symbol there. Now moving along, we have the Aggravator. This is a long range siege unit. Uh, very, very good T1 bot siege unit. Its technical title is a rocket bot dash good versus static defense. It's the only unit in the game, I think, that has like a description of what it's exactly good against. But anyway, uh, it, it, its its description is apt. It it is very good against static defense, and it's worth uh, it's worth knowing that they're your they're your go to against light laser turrets or even medium emplacements, anything like that. They're uh, a good unit to pull out. You can see that they have a pretty good range. Uh, I believe the, the furthest range of any of the T1 units, at least, short of the well, at least for the bots anyway. And they fire out these little missiles that go and do a little bit of AOE damage. You use these to push uh, front lines backwards, to push light laser turret emplacements, to, to 
to force your enemy to step away from their defensive line so that hopefully you can absorb all their metal and use it in your army. Now, next up, we have the Thug, which is a light plasma bot. And by the way, you'll probably see a lot of similarities between the Cortex and the Armada units, if you're familiar with both. Uh, that's, you know, part of the game design, right, is that they're balanced and sort of incongruently so. They, there are similarities between the units and the rules that they fill, but they, some some of them, not so much in the bots, they're, they're very similar. But as, as we move forward, you'll see that there's a lot more... There's a, there, there's a lot of ways that the, the roles are filled, but in different ways. I guess is the most eloquent way I can think of putting that. Anyway, the Thug fills the, the Skirmisher role for the Cortex faction. It is a light plasma bot, which means that it fires a plasma projectile. I'll show you what that means here. You can see it lobs out this little plasma projectile thing, this little, little blast of energy. Anything that, in fact, describes itself as a plasma weapon is going to fire some sort of explosive ball just like this one. Uh, it might be bigger, smaller, faster, whatever, but it'll be similar to that degree. The Thug is a good tier one unit if you have a lot of metal to spare and you want something a little more rugged on your front line. They are seen in areas where the terrain is rough and difficult to traverse, so you don't want to go for vehicles, but the area is a a small area like a valley or some other some other point that's difficult to contest right so you can't throw light units in there because their aoe will just destroy them immediately so you need something with a little bit more health and a little bit more a little bit more gusto to it a little a little more pizzazz you know what i mean so this is this is kind of the option that you would go for if you needed something to contest a, a choke point uh, or just uh, a soak to help your aggravators push a little bit harder uh, just put these in front of your aggravators so that they can soak up more of the damage while your aggravators shell away from a longer distance. Very, very good, very key unit for the Cortex faction. Now moving along, we have the Tier 1 Constructor, and I'll cover this one, but the rest of them are basically the same. The Tier 1 Constructor can do all of the T1 uh, buildings and, and other, other factories, all that stuff, uh, as well as tech up a tier. So the, the corresponding... Tier 1 Constructor, so for, for bots, it can go to Tier 2 Bot Lab for the vehicle, the Tier 1 Bot Constructor, or the Tier 1 Vehicle Constructor, it can go to the Tier 2 Vehicle Lab, and, and so forth. So that's that's important to keep in mind for what, what area you want to tech into. As far as Cortex is concerned, there's a lot of buildings here that you can produce, and a lot of them are very similar to the Armada offshoots. You have your anti-air defenses, because you'll notice that they have the little triangle here. Oh, and I, I guess I should cover the, uh, the the symbol for these skirmisher bots. You can see that it has a, when I select the thug here, you can see that it has a small little red plus sign. And that means that this unit strikes ground units. So it's a it's a, it's a a ground unit and it's meant for, for fighting on the ground and, and ground units only. Now back to the T1 constructor. There's not much to say about this. This is sort of your default constructor. It can build advanced solar collectors, um, you know, all, all these different, Un these different units and, and structures. The interesting one, the, the different one from Armada is this exploiter, which is an armed metal extractor, which is sort of interesting. It has a little laser turret on it. Um, I, I'm not going to go into depth about that, but that is one of the differences between Armada and Cortex. Moving along, we have the Grave Robber, which is a stealthy res reclaim repair bot. So that's a lot of keywords and we'll break down all of them. But first you'll notice that the border of this has this sort of construction tape look to it and indeed that's because it it possesses build power and so it's considered a constructor same as the tier one construction bot so anything that you see with with that construction tape marking on the, the top left hand corner of its card is some sort of unit that's able to to either pick up units or build or, or somehow use build power to create structures on the battlefield or, or interact with with things on the battlefield in that way now, uh, starting at the top here, we have Stealthy, which basically means that this unit cannot be detected by radar. So even if they have a radar emplacement and, and have radar vision of the area, where, where normally units would be shown as a little dot on the radar, the Grave Robber will not give off a radar presence, which is important for, for uh, reclaiming battlefields. Now, it's a Res Reclaim Repair Bot, which means that it can perform any of those functions. Resurrection, of course, is when a unit goes down, you it, it leaves a wreckage on the battlefield. And if it's in its intact state, 
uh, as a wreckage on the ground, you can r- resurrect it and bring it back to life. Uh, once again, fighting for your army, the undead horde, if you will. It can reclaim, which means that if you hit E, you enter your, your reclaim mode and you can select things. So we'll use these bushes here as an example. It will go over there and it will pick them up. And you can see that it will, in the bottom left here, it'll show you that it's it's giving us the energy that it's pulling out of these plants here. Sort of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn-esque plant-eating robots. But yeah, and so that's that's kind of its its task. It fills the same position as the the Armada Lazarus, and so you you want to send a few of these to the front line to reclaim metal and resurrect any units that you might need to keep in the fight, like thugs or aggravators or such like that. Now, one key difference between Cortex and Armada is that uh, Armada has access to the Tick, which is a small harassment unit where the the Cortex does not have the Tick. They sort of have a, a general purpose all in one unit called the Grunt. Now, the Grunt is an infantry bot, and it has two laser cannons on its arms, as you can see. Uh, It's fairly quick, and it can run around with these laser cannons and put out a lot of damage. So, usually what you'll see when when a Cortex player is amassing units is they'll they'll just produce a ton of Grunts, because they're sort of a general purpose unit that kind of fills all the roles that the Tick and the Pawn for Armada fill on their own. It's It's fast, so it's usually used as a raiding bot, so you can run it past defenses without it being... Uh, mow down, especially if you have enough of them in numbers. You can also get surrounds on enemies, which is extremely beneficial because if you attack an enemy from one side, there is flanking damage in this game, which means that if you attack a, a unit from multiple angles, it will take more damage from 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 different sides. So uh, very, very important to include these in your composition so that units are taking the maximum amount of damage and, and thus your efficiency goes up, right? Which is really important, especially if you're down and you need to come back into the game somehow. Uh, other notes about the, the Grunt are that it's, a, it's, it's fairly cheap, fairly inexpensive, so it's, it's a good idea to produce a lot of these. And they're also, they, they outrange the Armada equivalent by quite a bit. So the micro potential is actually huge on this unit. You almost always don't want to be the aggressor when using these units. You want to be, um, well, that's not the right word. Don't don't take that advice. What, what I mean by that is that you, you don't want to be pushing into an army that's pushing against you. You don't want to like, you know, 300-esque charge into your enemy with grunts. What you really want to do is have them coming towards you uh, and and let me draw a little diagram here. So imagine that there's an enemy line of units here and they're advancing this way. You want your grunts to start attacking these units and as they're attacking automatically, you want to pull them backwards as this line uh, as this line of units moves forward. And the reason for that is that they're going to be able to turn around and shoot backwards where the other units, if they're Armada, are not going to be able to reach you in time. So you can actually, you know, sort of infinitely scale your damage to to tear down those those pushes, which is important. Now that concludes the tier one bots. So if you if you if you came here for the tier one bots, that's all I have to say about those. Very good early game units. Probably one of the most common choices for for early game units. And uh, now we're going to step into the next section. So this is the tier two bot lab section. There's a lot to cover here. So, you know, grab your popcorn. I have my drink. I'll take a sip here and we'll get right into it. So tier two bot labs starting at the top. First off, you have the Sheldon. This is a mobile artillery unit and downright oppressive. This is probably one of the best units in the, in the Cortex, the Cortex kit, the Cortex commander's uh, field guide, field field of strategy. This unit is really, really oppressive to very early units, the T1 units especially. It can, when you when you mass them, when you when you produce enough of them to get maybe 10, 15 of them in, in, in one big group, you can start laying siege to really any T1 defense with basically no issue. You can see this thing has a tremendous range, like shooting super, super far out there. And that's, that's long enough to take down any of the T1 defenses and indeed some of the T2 defenses as well. Aside from that, they're also fairly fast. Their their move speed is comparable to something like a Hound for Armada. So they actually serve as a skirmish bot as well because they're they're able to push the front lines so quickly. And then as soon as the 
frontline push deteriorates, they can retreat just as quickly as well and then avoid being crushed by the ensuing counterattack. So that's something to keep in mind when you're using these, but I would definitely recommend them because they're an amazing artillery unit. And when you build four or five and then 10 of them, you you have enough firepower to tear down basically any non-T2 unit composition. Uh, the, 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 the key difference between the Sheldon, um, as opposed to the, as opposed to any of the other artillery units is that it does fire a light projectile. So you'll see it, it fires a plasma projectile, but it's actually fairly small. So it is important to get them up in numbers. Um, you really do want to make, make quite a few of them because one or two isn't really going to make as big a difference, especially if you're facing against tanks, but five to 10 can, can definitely turn the tide in some, some battle scenarios. Now, moving along, we have the bed bug, which is an amphibious crawling bomb. Uh, what, what can I say about these? I, I love these things. I think they're hilarious. They've got this cute little sprinting animation on them as they run around the battlefield. And then when they get close to an enemy, if you have fire at will on, they'll detonate and explode. If they're destroyed by an enemy, they'll detonate and explode as well, but for a smaller, smaller radius. I think there's a way to well i'm not sure not sure how to show the explosive radius but it's a lot bigger if you self-destruct it so we can uh in fact why don't we start producing an extra one here and we'll come back to this in a little while once that's out now the next step is the manticore and you'll notice it has the triangle on it uh, that means that it is a uh, a anti-air ship and indeed this is a, a fairly good anti-air option it fires a barrage of different missiles as well as a light uh what, what would that be called a, a flat cannon on the on the top of its head there you can see and it fires that every once in a while so it's not a it's not a super fast flat cannon but it does do a good amount of damage especially to t1 units uh t1 aircraft that are clumped up you can do a, t a tremendous amount of damage with just a few manticores. Definitely a reliable anti-air option. And uh, any 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 place you need to have some mobile anti-air, or especially if there's a front line and you need to prevent the, the enemy from harassing you with T1 aircraft, uh, this is a great place to put a manticore. Now we can see the bed bug here, and uh, let's see if we can detonate this via friendly fire. Here we go. Looks like this will work. So we'll take a look at this explosion here as this gets uh, detonated by this Sheldon. Okay, not bad. You can see it left a little crater there. Now if we bring this over here and we put it in the same spot, I'm going to hit Control and then D, which will self-destruct it. You can see the explosion was quite a bit more powerful. So that, that's the important of microing those bed bugs is making sure that you detonate them in the proper area and, 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 and take control of them when you're detonating them. Make sure that you're, you're choosing to detonate them. It will increase their yield by almost twice as much. Anyways, stepping along here, we have the Mammoth. This is a interesting unit. It's a heavily armored assault bot. And I mean, pretty apt description really and you can see it actually has a tremendous range with these uh, dual heavy lasers on its head it can fire away with this thing has 15,600 health which is phenomenal for a bot and it's a it's a it's a tank i mean you you really use this thing not literally but it, you use this thing to soak damage on the front lines they can also put out a tremendous amount of damage so they're really a good unit for if you want to push a front line with some artillery behind it. I think probably a, a very common strategy would be to build two or three of these, put them at the front, and then a bunch of Sheldons behind. Pretty good way to produce a tremendous amount of damage per second on a concentrated area, having the Sheldons fire away at whatever these mammoths can see. Definitely a good unit, but it comes at a steep cost. You're paying 2,200 metal and 35,000 energy for a slow moving but extremely tanky and high damage unit sort of the theme of cortex is they 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 have this juggernaut feel to a lot of their units which is kind of interesting the the use cases for the mammoth are are pretty much equal for offense and defense i mean they're a very good unit for holding control points holding holding zones where you need to prevent the enemy from pushing through because of their tremendous range and their their high damage laser 
So they will be able to shut down most T1 aggression because T1 bots aren't really going to be able to melt these unless they're in extremely high numbers, which you're going to be having a problem with in, in general if you get to that stage. So that's, you know, that's kind of a moot point. So that's that's sort of the use case that I see for the mammoth. Definitely a a siege breaker, or, or rather a, a a defense breaker unit, uh, as as it would be called. Now moving along, we have the radar and anti radar bots. These are fairly standard bots and, and pretty easy to explain. The radar bot just has a huge line of sight as well as gives off a radar presence uh, in the area. So this is a this is a great option for when you're sieging and you need you need some sort of mobile vision on the front lines. You plop one of these down and it gives you the vision for your artillery and your mammoths and all other range of units that we're going to get into today to see out in front of it and and siege those areas. Now, almost as importantly is the radar jammer bot. This conceals your radar presence on the map. So the only way that they're going to be able to detect you is with line of sight vision, which of course, you know, every unit has some line of sight radius, but a lot of them, a lot of the frontline units won't have it. It's usually radar units or something like that that have frontline or have line of sight vision. So these are just as important for helping your push move forward successfully because they're going to keep the artillery off of you, at least for most of the push where the radar would normally see you. Uh, indeed, these these roles are filled by other units as well across the, the various types of units that you can produce, the, the bot labs and the vehicle labs and navy and all that good stuff so we'll see more of these in different incar incarnations here and there but that's their default rule you can see they also have their own little symbol a little sort of almost like a wi-fi symbol up in the top there next up we have the sumo which is an armored assault bot sort of a lower cost and and slightly more mobile version of the mammoth you can see only costing 560 um, 560 metal to produce this very very cheap compared to the mammoth but it does provide a tremendous amount of damage soaking ability it also has a laser attack but you can see that its range is much less this is a really good option for if you are pushing against a unit that is committing to t1 units maybe they're spamming out units grunts ticks pawns anything like that and you need something that can quickly dispatch of those units but also has enough damage to soak up the or enough health to soak up the damage that those units can put out. The sumo is a great option for that. So indeed, it has 5,400 health, which is quite tremendous compared to the the units, the the other units around here. I mean, if you take a look at the Sheldon, working at 940. You take a look at the 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 fiend, which we'll get into. It's 1,060. So far and away, an extremely tanky unit. And when you get enough of these in mass on the front lines, they can really they can really really easily push through a front a front line. I would say that if you have a, an opponent that has bunkered down with T1 defenses, the sumo is probably a great option for that. If you have an opponent that's bunkered down with T2 defenses, the mammoth is probably your your better option because your, your sumos will probably be torn apart by those defenses pretty quickly, but the mammoth is going to be able to soak a lot more damage, almost three times as much by the looks of their health. Now moving on, we have the Arbiter. This is an awesome unit. This is a rocket bot, a long range rocket bot. And you can see its range is tremendous. I mean, humongous range. You can you can really siege just miles and miles out. And uh, you you use these things exactly as you might imagine. You, you bring them close to your front line, but not really that close because they don't need to be. And they shell away these massive rockets out towards the enemy. So if we send one of these rockets over here, we'll take a good look at exactly the explosion that this produces. You can see, there you go. These are an extremely powerful tool that you have at your disposal as a Cortex player. If you're not using these, you're definitely missing out on a very important aspect of the, the Cortex bot lab uh, ability, the, the, one, of the, one of the most important units that you have. This thing is, is designed to tear apart those defenses that are either in hard to reach places or are so bunkered up that there's not really a good way to get units in there to to blow up those defenses. So you really need some sort of extremely long range option, long range and high impact damage, high high spikes of damage. The rocket bot is really what you're looking for. They're an extremely effective siege weapon, but you have to be careful because they can super easily be overrun by tier one pawns and, and grunts and ticks and all that, you know, the, the raider units, so to speak. 
So it's important that you cover these with either sumos or mammoths or fiends or some other some other type of unit that is able to cover these and, and make sure that they're not being harassed by the T1 units. This is where compositions become incredibly important, and indeed they are incredibly important in this game overall. But when you're building a unit composition, you need to look at the abilities that your current composition has. Like, can I can I do precision strikes with missiles? Can I soak damage? Can I deal with a swarm of units? All these considerations come to mind. And when you're looking to fill out the role of pushing back defenses, the Arbiter is probably what you want to choose to assign that role to your composition. Now, moving along, we have the Tech 2 Constructor. This is the first Tier 2 Constructor that we've seen so far, and all the Tier 2 Constructors are very similar, but we'll cover this one specifically. You can see that it has the various different options for the T2 buildings, the Fusion and Advanced Fusion Reactors, the Cerberus, which is a three-headed geothermal plant from, um, from that, well, it goes on a, a geothermal vent, like you might see over here. And instead of producing power. Well, it does produce power, but also it, it, it is able to rotate around and shoot three massive plasma bursts. So this is actually a really interesting option strategically because on some maps it's very useful, on other maps it's not useful at all. So kind of have to be very situationally aware. I would say on this map it could potentially be extremely useful if you put one of these on this this side over here, not to spoil the T3 surprise, but if you put one on one of these geothermal plants, you could shell away at the different areas. And in fact, let's uh, take a look at this here. You can see sort of how it looks in the, the shadow there. Anyway, that's one of the interesting Cortex uh, buildings that you can produce. Now I'm just looking, seeing if there's anything else that's, that's worth mentioning. Most of this stuff is relatively, relatively the same as Armada. Uh, I guess the the tactical missile launcher is different. This is sort of a miniature nuclear nuclear launcher. It launches these tiny nuclear nuclear missiles that can do quite a bit of damage, and you can see it has a pretty good range, pretty pretty good. It's not as huge as some other options like the EMP missile silo that Armada has, but it is a great option if you want to siege a front line and you really need to tear through some extremely tough defenses. This is a great option to to burst those down in you know just one fell swoop not as powerful as a regular nuclear missile of course but still a, a good option for that sort of sieging um, next up we get to the twitcher now this is interesting because this is the first unit that we're seeing that the first combat engineer that we see that comes out of a bot lab if you recollect for armada or let me remind you anyways Armada combat engineers come out of their vehicle plant, which means that it's actually a lot more difficult, or, or rather it's just a bit more expensive to get to the tech level you need in order to produce combat engineers. Whereas for Cortex, you get a combat engineer out of your T2 bot lab, which is relatively easier to obtain. So these are extremely powerful units for a few different reasons. One is they can build these construction turrets and they have a lot of build power. You can see they have 125 build power, which is, is pretty good. They can build all of these different units. They can build these oppressors, the, the, the boats. They can build ducks, which are an amphibious unit. We'll cover in just a second. Um, they can build fiends, which is the next unit up. And we'll also talk about those and, and why that's so important that you can build these. They can also build the T1 bot lab and T1 constructors as well. So if you need to tech up, as well as being able to build a whole host of different defensive options. So they can build these persecutors, which are a, a plasma battery. They can build these coastal defenses, air defenses, landmines, radar, jammers, walls, all this amazing stuff. Super, super useful. And to top it all off, they're pretty fast. So you can really move these things around and, and send them around. So it is not uncommon for people to request that you give them a few of these. If you are playing Cortex and you're a backliner, I would definitely comply because they are a very powerful unit. And if you give them to your allies, they're going to be able to do some really powerful stuff with them. So just be aware that if you're playing Cortex and you're going bots and you tech up to a tech two bot lab, some of your teammates might want some of these and it would be extremely helpful to them. They'd, they'd be extremely grateful for you to give them a few of them. So just keep that in mind. Be a team player and uh, help your team out because it will help your team out tremendously. You'll see it in the front line. It will expand rapidly. Uh, part of the reason is due to this next unit that we're going to jump into, the Fiend. Infamous is the Fiend. Very, very infamous. A lot of players struggle to deal with this thing. It is a nasty unit. Absolutely devastating. Tremendous amount of damage per second. It does an AoE attack. You see it shoots these bouts of fire in a line. It's the same as the static defense turret, which I think is called the Dragon's Breath or the, the Dragon's Teeth or something like that. But you can see it shoots these bouts of flame. 
these things put out a tremendous amount of damage per second, 240 damage per second to be exact. But the, the real kicker with these is that they explode when they die too. So when you kill one of these, they explode in a, into a pile of scrap. So there's no body to resurrect and, and bring back to life which is one of the reasons why they're such a great raiding vehicle is because they lose so much of their metal when they die, meaning that your enemy doesn't really gain very much from resur or from, from rec reclaiming the corpses of these things, which, you know, it's a, a huge strategic advantage. The, the other interesting thing about them is that if you, if you control D, which I'm not going to do yet because I'm not done showcasing it, they have a, a buffed up explosion when they die or when rather when they self-destruct so you can actually use them to burst down high target or high damage units that you don't think you'll be able to kill on on their own but maybe they're low health and you want to you want to scuff something you can have them explode on another unit and they'll do a ton of damage uh aside from that you can see they're tremendously fast they're 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 one of the the faster units in the game they are an, they are an assault bot but i would really call them a, a raider they they are often used to really punish front lines that have not gone up to tech two yet. If you're playing against an armada player that has not gotten their tech two bots up yet, these can be really really devastating. Their their only real counter, I, I would suppose, is is like static defenses. Those are the only things they can really tear these down with any any mark of efficiency. Any of the T one units are just either too slow or don't have enough health to really properly contest these things. So an, an excellent option and probably the, the unit that you're going to want to produce the most of when you're going into these T2 Cortex units. I'll take a sip of my drink here. Fanboying over this, this awesome unit a little too hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what else to say other than that. Make this unit, right? That's the takeaway here. Make this unit and make a lot of them. And your front line is going to be really easy to hold. They can run past enemy defenses and tear down bases really quickly. They can tear down T1 defenses per, with relative ease as well if you have enough of them in numbers. They're extremely good against large units because you can surround them and get that flanking bonus, do a tremendous amount of damage from all of them. They do an AoE attack, so if your enemy is swarming units, they're a great option for that because they're going to inadvertently kill a lot of that swarm just by trying to attack in general. Just an all-around amazing frontline unit and relatively cheap too. I mean, 200, 200 metal and 3,000 energy for one of these. If we compare it to something out of the T1 bot lab, we're looking at uh, more more than half that cost. So, so very similar, al almost the same cost to produce a thug or some other T1 unit. But you get so much more damage and, and such a more efficient package out of the fiend. So... I, I, the, the use cases for this are so general that it's almost hard to define, but basically you want to use these all the time, everywhere you can, because of that. they're that good. Anyways, <laughs> enough, enough fanboying about the, the Fiend. We're going to move on to the next unit here. Oh, sorry. One more thing. One more, one more note about the Fiend. The, the Twitcher can produce these. So the Twitcher can actually plop these down on the battlefield and produce them in, in the field. So that's the reason why these Twitchers are so important to your allies is because they want to be able to make these fiends for their front lines. And indeed, what a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll take something like this. They'll take fiends and they'll, they'll hold shift and left alt and queue up like a block of these things like that. And he will begin producing them. And then they just hit repeat and it will continue producing this block of 12 fiends forever. And you'll have this this sort of on-demand army that you can put at the front lines to build these things. And you can see it takes, what was that, like 30 seconds, 40 seconds to put one of these things together. But if you have two or three Twitchers pumping these things out, you can really make them pretty quickly. And then you have a standing army that's ready to go, extremely powerful and, and good against T2. And all just being pumped out by a single combat engineer or you know a group of, a single type of unit on the front lines. So... That's a, a little bit of a jump back and forth as to why, you know, these units are so powerful. But you can see now I have two fiends, double the power. It's going to be tremendously useful on the front lines. Now, what I can also show you with this is that when I take this over here, you can see when I explode this, it's actually a pretty sizable explosion. It does a lot of damage. And uh, that's, you know, it's kind of cool because that does mean that you can actually use these things sort of strategically. There's some, some micro potential, right? Very, very cool unit. Now, next up is your spy bot. This is your, your Spectre. 
and it is a interestingly enough it has its it has a construction thing but it doesn't have a uh i guess it can reclaim that's interesting i never noticed that these could reclaim sort of a odd power for a spy bot to have but anyway um this thing can walk around and it's invisible well it's it's normally invisible it takes a second to recloak uh, and you use these things to normally push the front line. You can see if I move it over here, this sort of arc shows its line of sight value. And you can see that it's tremendously high. So these are basically a walking camera that you can use to spy on your enemies and, and get line of sight vision, which is the best type of vision because it, it guarantees that your artillery has accurate data, right? Or accurate, accurate positioning. The other interesting thing, just like the Armada spy, is if you self-destruct it, it produces this EMP explosion that stuns everything around it in a little circle. So important to use that because this stun actually lasts for a good long while. It's, uh, it's almost 20 seconds, I, I believe. And that can very easily turn the tide of a battle when you need to slow down an enemy force so that your artillery can work on them just a little bit more. Important to include these in your composition. We were, we were talking about compositions earlier and how units will benefit from having certain abilities unlocked for your composition, right? Like rockets to, to siege bases, you have units that are tanky, you have units that can do AOE. This this is the the vision, but also the the stun potential because there's not a lot of stun options for Cortex, um, at least not on the ground. We'll we'll get into some stunning options for the for the air later on in the next the next uh, parts of this this movie <laughs> this this feature length film. Stepping into the next bot we have here is the duck. And what an adorable little unit. I mean, perfectly named, perfectly designed. It looks like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. As you can see, ducks are well known for their high energy laser blasts out of their eyes. And uh, it also has a torpedo launcher, so it can attack naval as well. Um, I don't know if I can, I can showcase that here, so you'll just have to take my word for it. But they have a time torpedo launcher, which basically recharges after a certain amount of time. It has a little cooldown bar. Um, but these things walk along the bottom of the ocean. And they're sort of the counter to the platypus for Armada, which is a which is their amphibious unit. Um, but in my opinion, these are much, much better because they can actually attack ships or rather submarines that are on the water. Whereas the amphibious units for Armada just float along the top and they don't have a way to attack those units down below. So these are sort of a ground to ground and ground to naval i guess ground to submerged naval <laughs> they, they can attack anywhere in the naval region the naval plane with uh with their torpedo but you know specifically able to target submarines whereas the platypus for armada which this is similar to can only attack it, it is a a ground to ground to ground or ground to above seas so you know any any ship above water uh, and also a ground to air so it, it has an anti-aircraft attack which this does not so interesting decisions, strategic decisions to make, but you can see that it has sort of the first of these split bars here because it's sort of blue and red, and that's because it's a multifunctional bot, multi-purpose. You can send these into the water and they can attack the they can attack the naval units, you can pull them out of the water, and they will attack the um they will they will attack the ground units with a fairly high damage laser, some similar to the sumo or the mammoth in uh in, in damage and range here. Now, moving on, we have the spy commander, or the, the decoy commander, rather. Uh, sort of an interesting unit. Not not very practically useful in, in most PvP games. I, don't, I'm, I, I hardly ever see them, except sometimes it's like a joke. But they do have a sort of interesting kit for what they're able to build. They can build these mines, both the medium and the heavy. Oh, and they can build the light mines, too. That's nice. They can build a whole range of defenses, as well as wind turbines and stuff like that. Um, naval naval equivalents as well. The the really funny thing is they have this D gun that's like a fake D gun, sort of goes along the ground and it looks exactly like a D gun, but does barely any damage. Let's see if we friendly fire here. Yeah, you can see it does. I mean, it does a little bit of damage, but it's not it's not anything remarkable. It's not like a good a good unit per se. Good good option. So this is kind of an interesting interesting one if you're looking for something to. I don't know, mess with your enemy, I suppose. Um, I'm not really sure what the, the use cases for these would be other than maybe distracting your enemy and pulling their units to one side. I guess you could bait out your enemy into showing their hand by showing how many units they have if they commit to trying to kill this thing and then it ends up not being a real commander. That's that's one use case I guess I could see for it, but other than that, not very practically useful. Now next up is a bizarre unit. This one, 
has some mastery to it. Mastery that I don't have, but surely somebody out there does. Uh, this is the Commando, and it is it is far and away one of the most interesting units available. You can see it has this cool, like, I don't know, laser blaster, I guess. That I, honestly, I really like it. I actually think this looks really cool. But it's uh, it's kind of difficult to quantify like how to use these things, what role they fill in. There's a few interesting words here. Stealthy paratrooper bot. So stealthy, of course, we know means cannot be detected by radar. Uh, but it also, you can see it has this radar field around it, this jammer field around it, which is interesting. And the reason for that is that it's also a constructor. So it can build these different things using construction beams, construction uh, build power, you know, hands. So interestingly enough, you can use these things to build their own transports. And you can see it can put one of these transports together. The transport can pick it up. And then the paratrooper word, which is unique to only this bot, I believe. I don't think there's any other bot that has this, this feature. When the transport dies, the unit that it's carrying typically will just explode and the unit is lost. This unit will just fall out of the sky from the transport and it will be perfectly fine. So, like, I maybe, hold on, maybe if I self-destruct this transport, we can watch that. Hopefully it doesn't just destroy the commando. We'll see. Yeah, okay, there you go. So you can see this thing just falls out of the sky and it's perfectly fine. Let me uh, build one of these and I'll show you what happens to any other unit that that happens to. So sort of an interesting option with these is to build a whole bunch of them, put them all in transports and send them across the map, you know, put them, put them all the way on the other side of the map and you'll end up with sort of this like this this i mean yeah paratrooper army flying over to the other side of the map and wrecking havoc over there so let's see if we pick up a sheldon and then we self-destruct this what i'm imagining is going to happen is that the sheldon is just going to get destroyed it's just going to be lost actually i have a better idea let's let's choose a unit that doesn't have the risk of being destroyed by the explosion let's pick up the sumo which is quite a bit tankier and then we'll self-destruct this and we'll see what happens. We'll do a little bit of testing here. We're all learning together. Isn't that fun? Yeah, okay, you can see. So the sumo just gets destroyed when the transport is destroyed. The, the unit is lost. Kind of an interesting ability. And there's there's a lot of like weird plays that you can do with this concerning dropping these into the enemy base. And you can also build up these, these turrets and stuff and build up little d defensive emplacements with them behind enemy lines because they're... They're stealthy, so they can't be found by radar. But also, they are—they have a little jammer field around them, so you, so they can't be—you know—they can't be detected. So, really, really weird unit, really odd, but can do some really interesting stuff. I think. Now, moving along, we have the termite. This is a all-terrain bot, which I suppose they figured every every faction ought to have some some type of all-terrain bot. But if we tell this thing to come up here, you can see that it just starts climbing away up the wall until it eventually gets up here at which point you know you can do whatever you like with it show you its attack is kind of a cool like heat ray vision very neat kind of a, a unique attack which we'll we'll see it come back in some of the other units later down the line but interesting nonetheless uh op options for this or sort of i guess use cases for this would be some sort of siege where the the unit or the the enemy is relying on natural terrain in order to block their path maybe maybe for instance they have this area walled off and there's tons of defenses but there's this nice wall right here so you just send the unit up and over and then you're in their main base and you can go wreck havoc kind of the use case that i see for this sort of a interesting strategic option like i said when you're looking at your composition of your army and you're thinking okay what abilities do i have and what what abilities don't i have this is uh, this is one way to one way to get the ability to traverse terrain freely. Moving on, we have a, another advanced crawling bomb, or, or rather, we have and we have an advanced amphibious crawling bomb. The the other bomb was just a regular crawling bomb, but this is an advanced crawling bomb. What does that mean? Well, it translates directly to firepower. Uh, this thing is is essentially a miniature nuke packed into a little crawling bomb package, but the interesting thing about this thing is you can turn it invisible and cloak it. So you can see this little nuclear care package starts moving around and it uh, it is it is now a cloaked nuclear bomb 
at your disposal. And these are a great option for creating a comeback scenario where your enemy is pushing into you and you don't have a standing army and they have a lot of tanky units. You can produce a few of these and if you micro them properly, you can put in a tremendous amount of hurt on the enemy. Now, just like the other exploding units, it is important that you self-destruct them in order to get their full destructive power. They, they rely on self-destructing in order to do their full damage. Uh, but you can see that the full damage, which I'll showcase on this metal extractor here, is huge. I mean, a massive explosion, like a nuclear bomb. Su super, super tremendous explosion, which will wipe away T1 uh, defenses, T1 units. Any sort of T1 thing is going to be gone in that explosion, as well as T2 units. A lot of the T2 units are going to be devastated as well. Anything but the tankiest of units are going to be blown away by that explosion. So two or three of these microed properly can absolutely turn the tides of a battle just by just the sheer fact that they're able to uh, just instantly kill a lot of the really critical units, uh, as well as even tanky units. Like you could use these, I think it takes three of them to blow up a single mammoth. Could be wrong about that, but it, it's, it's, it's either a few more or maybe one less. But it takes, it takes, you know, not very many of them to completely destroy a bunch of units. But it does come down to efficiency, right? Because you're paying 540 metal and 26,000 energy for them. So you kind of need to do that much damage, at least, to the enemy units. Which usually isn't hard, because if they're spamming T1 units or T2 units, you're going to be able to take out 10, 15 of those units if they're gr grouped up together. That's definitely what I would recommend as far as strategy goes, if you're looking to... Uh, to use these things, target clumped up units as well as you can. Target high value units, so things like radar and artillery are, are extremely prone to this sort of attack. But also don't be afraid to use it to just completely destroy their front line, right? Because if you take out all the front line units, their artillery is completely exposed and then you can make 200 fiends and wipe out the rest of the artillery like that. Plus as an added bonus, you get a bunch of metal out of it that way, which is always something important to take into consideration. So I know that was an extremely long-winded explanation. Uh, th there's a lot to cover here with the bots. Cortex has an extremely elaborate set for their bots, which is contrary to the Armada, which has an extremely elaborate set for their their vehicles. Uh, not, that's not to say that the vehicles aren't just as interesting, and we'll get into them in just a second. But that does conclude the rest of these uh, T2 bots. And like I said, for the T1 bots, in case you're you know jumping around the video, if there's anybody in the comments that has more experience with Cortex, I, I relinquish, you know, I, I, I give you the option, I present you with the option to give any of your helpful tips and insight into these units because I am typically an Armada player. So I have a little bit less, a little bit less familiarity with these units, just, just maybe half as many games played with them. Now, that being said, we're going to step into the next factory and we're going to take a trip all the way down south to the land of traders down to the vehicle lab. So T1 vehicles, there's quite a few that you can choose from here, quite a lot of options and important to know what all of them are. So let's start up the vehicle section. First up, you have an amphibious constructor, same as a T1 constructor, except that it can build water equivalents of everything. So very, very self-explanatory there. Build amphibious complexes and seaplane platforms. Just like the Armada video, I'm not going to cover seaplanes. I'm going to give seaplanes their own video because they're just kind of that interesting and that that complicated. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you if you want to see seaplane discussion, um, you know, leave a comment, and uh, you 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 will see some seaplane content in the future. Anyway, a T1 constructor, same as all the other T1 constructors, same as the T1 constructor here, which we're going to skip this time now that we're familiar with the constructors and what they do, sort of their purpose. The only note is that this is how you go up to T2 vehicles, which is like I said earlier. So moving along, we have the Garpike, a light amphibious tank. You can see this thing has a cute little cute little nose on it that can shoot out a little plasma blast. Actually kind of a really reasonably sized plasma blast. Do a lot of damage. Uh, these are amphibious tanks. And so these are what you use when you have an, a you have a naval victory. You have some sort of naval conquer that uh that you you know you've taken over a a naval a naval win, you know, you've conquered the high seas, <laughs> you've, you've, you've tamed the high seas. And now, now you, you need to know like, okay, what do I, what do I do to turn this naval victory into some sort of land victory that, that can actually help my team. Right. Cause a lot of times you're left with that, that, that sort of decision paralysis where you're thinking, okay, well now I've beat my enemy out of the sea and there's not really anything they can do to come back in and contest me. What can I do to further my advantage and help my team out? Uh, there's a few options you have. Of course, you can switch to seaplanes or regular planes. Um, 
you can just transition away from sea and go go into a land-based army back at your side of the map or whatever area you've conquered if there's land available or what i like to do is produce an amphibious water complex and an amphibious unit complex which uh, we just showed off here and this can produce a whole host of different units out of it but one of them is these amphibious tanks and so what i like to do is make a whole ton of these light amphibious tanks just just you know mass them in in tremendous numbers and then swarm the enemy beaches with them because oftentimes at least the very first time that you do that they're not going to be expecting it and you can usually get a tremendous amount of uh damage out of you know destroying destroying economy structures destroying resources destroying metal extractors destroying all sorts of stuff and you can really swarm their bases from seemingly out of nowhere which can be a tremendous advantage to your teammates when you're when you're um looking for when you're when they're looking to push and then suddenly the the amount of units that the enemy has available because you've destroyed their eco is is smaller of course they're going to be much they're going to be extremely grateful for that so always worth some always worth some consideration and uh and and that's probably my favorite strategy if you if you'd like to see that strategy strategy go check out some of the supreme straits videos that's that's one of my favorite ways to win a supreme straits game is to take over one of the seas there and then start using amphibious units to harass them from the sides it's a sort of an underappreciated art i feel but definitely one of my favorites so you know while you're while you're out there uh, don't forget to subscribe if i haven't asked you already this video which i'm pretty sure i haven't does mean a lot to me really appreciate it and we're going to move on to the next unit so next up we have the lasher this is a missile truck i believe both factions have access to a missile truck i, I can't remember i think it's called a whistler for armada uh, the lasher fires out this sort of puny little missile, but it does track. So if you, if you, uh, you know, if a unit's moving around or whatever, the missile will track it and, and make sure that it hits. Uh, these things are kind of interesting. They're they're an option for sieging if you want to have, I guess, a more mobile sieging option and, and just sort of a more consistent damage output. They're also anti-air, which is probably, I mean, arguably, they're they're more useful uh region right that's 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 what they're more useful for is is shooting down light aircraft um they do have a pretty effect a pretty huge effective range though so they you you, you can make these and then use them as a dual purpose siege and anti-aircraft vehicle but there's definitely better options for sieging so you can see that it has sort of this weird almost like maroon colored indicator uh, it has the triangle to indicate that it's anti-air but it has the maroon background to sort of show that it's it's also anti-ground uh, which sort of sort of symbolizes the dual purpose nature of this thing use cases for these i mean you can put them behind your front line and they're just going to be a constant stream of dps which is always nice you can also keep them there for anti-air purposes so they're just a good a good mix in for your composition i would definitely put maybe two or three of these behind your front line uh, just to make sure that either any light units like ticks or something don't accidentally sneak through because these are these are seeking of course so they're going to be able to hit those or to make sure that no no scout craft get get too close and and manage to reveal your base or your front line or whatever you're looking at to your enemy now moving along we have the brute probably the most common unit in the uh the t1 vehicle era you can see the unit design on this thing is just hilarious it's got this little this little grate on the front of it for for mowing down hordes of infantry it doesn't actually but it's you know it's kind of a cool design uh it's got this sort of stocky world war one era tank look to it which i just absolutely love and it fires the excuse me it fires a nice little plasma projectile you can see it lobs those over there very nice yeah tremendous unit uh has almost 2000 health which is really good for a t1 unit can can definitely feel like you're you're going up a, against an immovable wall when you're fighting these things especially when they're in mass and they they really are the workhorse of the t1 vehicle era i'd say this is probably the most common unit that you're going to produce and there's a good reason for it they're they're strong they're relatively fast they have a high attack damage and they're just a uh, a good all-around unit for the t1 stage of the game now moving along we have a bit more complex of a unit we have the pounder which is a riot tank this is a interesting unit this one has a huge aoe on it you can see i don't even have a safe place to shoot this I tell it to fire over here you can see it doesn't look like that crazy of an explosion but it does a tremendous amount of aoe damage but also probably more importantly it has impulse on its on its on its attack uh, it's an effect called impulse 
And uh, it's called a riot cannon, I guess is the, the term they use for it. But basically what it means is that it will it will stop enemies in their tracks. It will, it will impart like velocity onto them, I guess. Uh, meaning that if it shoots into a horde of T1 units, it will scatter them all over the place. I mean, it will literally shoot them up into the air and, and blow them all around the place, which is really cool because it means that these are a very effective unit for stopping early swarming, which is sort of what Armada is, is uh, designed around, especially if you're going for bots. Now, the, the interesting, or, well, I guess something to be aware of is that these are relatively slow. Um, you can see it's sort of a slow-moving tank, and it also doesn't have a very huge range. So you have to be careful with this. Um, you, you, don't, you definitely don't want these to be on the front line, but you do want them to be immediately behind it. This is, you know, this is your second line, I guess, so to speak. This is, this is line 1.5 before you get to the artillery, uh, which is up next, and we'll, we'll step into here. Uh, the Wolverine, which is the sort of bombardier artillery of the of the uh, Cortex faction, you can see it lobs this nice big projectile up into the air, comes down, collides with the ground. Very standard for T1 artillery that we've seen so far, and it's a uh, it's a powerful unit. It's it has a pretty high effective range and is relatively inaccurate. But if you produce enough of them, of course, you're going to be able to siege T1 structures and and defenses and all sorts of other stuff relatively easily so when you're building a composition of t1 vehicles you're probably looking to mix in all three of these units with maybe a few lashers in the back for air support or uh, or rather just to keep their the enemy from having air support and yeah you're 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 looking at basically the artillery unit of the t1 era that's it, it really fills that artillery role wherever you need it if you want something to siege defenses you want something to break enemy lines the enemy is clumping up units you notice a lot this is really good for taking those out as well it's a relatively high damage blast that 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 plasma ball comes down with so it is important to it is important to to remember that uh that that damage can be friendly fired as well so if there's a bunch of enemies that are that are swarming you you know they're they're all running in between the cracks of all your tanks and everything they're, they're getting all up in your grill these will continue to fire at them. And those those blasts may or may not rain down on your own units and devastate them, which is a pretty common tactic to use your own, use your enemy's AOE damage against itself. So be, be aware of that. And if you notice that they're doing that, you can take these and switch this fire at will option to hold fire so that they don't rain down artillery fire on your own units. Now, moving along, we have the constructor, which of course we covered already. So we're going to skip that to the mine layer, the, uh, the trapper. I mean, couldn't have a better name. It, it places down mines. It can also, as an added bonus, put down these perimeter cameras, which are kind of nice. They, they give you a little bit of vision in an area without having to have a unit presence there. The cameras are themselves are cloaked, so they can't be seen by a, a line of sight. They can be detected by radar, though, which is important to remember. Oh, actually, can they? Oh, no, they are stealthy, actually. So they cannot be detected by radar. So they are invisible, uh, which is good to know. Uh, and it can also build these walls, which are kind of a good way to funnel units into certain areas that you want or don't want them. Well, I guess you wouldn't funnel units into an area you don't want them. Keep them out of a unit, uh, keep them out of an area that you don't want, rather, uh, and funnel them into an area that you do. Uh, kind of the use for, for Dragon's Teeth there. Uh, it also produces these mines, which, you know, range from light to heavy and serve their role as their name implies, right? The, the mines are all designed to deal with a certain class of unit, roughly speaking, the tech, the tech era of that, that, that uh, mine. So light mines would deal with T1, medium mines deal pretty well with T2, and heavy mines deal pretty well with T3. So that's kind of the, it's kind of how that shakes out and it's pretty self-explanatory. Now I will say that the, uh, the way that I like to put down mines, which I guess might be a useful tip to some of you guys, I like to put down a few rows of light mines so I'll, I'll use uh, shift and left alt, and then I'll hit Z to space them out. And I'll do a few rows of light mines like this. And then I'll take medium mines, and I'll do a few less rows, do maybe two rows of those behind them. And then I'll take heavy mines, and I'll do just like one row of you know fairly spaced out heavy mines, maybe two rows, doesn't hurt. And that way what you get is when the enemy sends in their swarm, of course, the light units are going to be first, so they hit all the light mines and get destroyed. The medium units are going to be a bit more tanky and a bit more survivable, so they're going to hit the medium mines, and then they're going to be destroyed. And then the only units that survive to push through are going to be the heavy units, which are going to hit the heavy mines. 
So it sort of like works as this kind of natural system to sift through the units and find the right ones and basically make sure that you're getting the, the maximum efficiency out of these mines. Because like obviously you don't want your heavy mines to be detonating on light units and, and light. You don't want to waste all your light mines on heavy units where they're not really going to affect them or anything. So that's kind of the strategy behind mine laying, but there's an art to it and, and really it only comes with experience. So that's all the advice I can really give to that. Moving along, we have the incisor, which is a light tank. It is a laser tank. So it shoots a little little laser blast. Kind of the Cortex theme, isn't it? Just using lasers whenever they can. Uh, I love it. I love some laser combat. It really reminds me of Star Wars blasters. Love that. And you can see it, it does a little bit of damage. It's also relatively fast. Uh, this is contrary to the Blitz for Armada, which is their fast light tank. I know I'm referencing them a lot. Uh, really, really encourage you to go check out the Armada unit thesaurus. Even if you don't plan on playing Armada, it is useful to know what units uh, your your enemy has, right? And how, how they are going to try and use those units because then you can counter them really easily. So anyway, uh, sell out aside or, or self promo aside. <laughs> Uh, the light the light tank is really good for harassment. It's really good for sneaking around enemy defenses and harassing all different sides. It's durable enough to go up against uh, light laser turrets if you have two or three of them. Um, but it's also fairly cheap and inexpensive, so you can commit a few of these to a, to a push or to a flank or something without actually risking a whole tremendous amount of metal where otherwise you would want to be producing brutes or pounders, artillery, lashers, whatever other else. So that's kind of the role that these fill. They're, they're, they're a light skirmish tank. They're good for harassment. They're good for flanking. All those kinds of sneaky maneuvers. Now the last unit is the scout unit, uh, which is this adorable little rascal, kind of just a, a tremendous little little tri-wheel looking thing with a cute little laser blaster on it. And this thing is super fast and it has a really huge line of sight, which you can see by this sort of hollow line right there, indicating that it can see super far away. And indeed that's what you use these for. They're, they're a scout unit with a little bit of DPS on them. So if you're looking to harass your opponent early game, which you always should, uh, this is a good unit for that. This is this is kind of a great option for harassing your opponent in a way that makes them, you know, they, they sort of have to commit resources to deal with this, right? But also, how much do you commit? Like, is it worth sparing some of your defenses from the front line, some of your units up there to, to deal with this? Or is it better to wait and just, you know, use the the units from, from some other thing? So sort of sort of difficult to uh to to quantify for your enemy that is how how much to dedicate to solving this issue but for you it's basically just putting this unit next to their metal extractor and watching it all explode which is of course a, a tremendous benefit to you and your team now that's all for the t1 vehicles it's quite a lot to talk about but there is a lot of strategy to those so it's important that we cover it next we're going to step into the next section which is now welcome welcome to the present the present is now we're in T2 vehicles. So T2 vehicles will follow this little uh, little line down here. What an adorable little collection of units we have here. First up, we have another amphibious tank. We actually have two more amphibious tank, which is interesting, but we'll start with the alligator, a medium amphibious tank. And you can see this this one fires a even larger little plasma blast and a little bit a little bit faster too out of these these sort of twin cannons. Really, really good option for early game harassment. If you if you want to build that amphibious complex and harass from the uh, harass from the ground, or rather harass from the ocean to the ground, it's a great option because it's not quite so expensive as this heavy tank, but it can it can deal a good amount of damage, a lot more than the light tank, and it's also a lot more durable as well. So that's kind of the role it fills. Similar, but not exactly the same. Now, next up, we have the poison arrow. This is the heavy amphibious tank, similar to the turtle for Armada. You can see that this thing has this huge, huge headed uh, cannon on it that lobs a massive projectile fairly, fairly uh, quickly too. You can see it sort of lobs these things all over the place. Very nice. Um, this is a great unit for sieging if you wanna if you wanted to siege a base and you needed some way to get to that base from the from the ocean. It's a great unit for that sort of case. It's also great on maps like this where there's a big a big water crossing here and you need to attack the land on, on either side. You can send these units underwater, of course, and they pop up on the land and have the ability to attack, which is always nice. Now, I, I don't have very much experience using these except for a few games, and every game that I have, has this has gone tremendously well, these these heavy amphibious tanks. They do so much damage that they can really tear, tear apart the uh, T1 units with relative ease. 
they attack fast enough that they can keep up with the swarm attack and they're they're just a, a really well-rounded unit i would definitely mix them in with other amphibious tanks either the light or the medium ones just to to really help mitigate that swarming effect um but they're definitely a great option if you're looking for for some sort of some, some something to harass from the water to the ground and the next unit that we're going to talk about is the fury the anti the anti-air flak vehicle um, you can see again that purple triangle indicating that's anti-air. Uh, I don't have a great way to demonstrate its attack here because it's you know I don't have enemy enemy aircraft flying above, but it fires a little flak projectile, which is basically the same as the 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 flak from a from a flak defensive turret, just one of the uh, the static defenses here, the bird shot. It's just, it's just the same thing, but on a wheeled truck. So you can really move this thing around the battlefield wherever you need. And this is really what you want to contest those T2 aircraft. When you're when you're looking at those T2 aircraft, I mean, the, the T1 anti-air just doesn't really cut it to take those things down quick enough. They can they can do enough damage to your troops to 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 provide for themselves to to explain their own cost uh, to the enemy to be efficient. In other words, so. It's important to have anti-air that scales to the proper tech level that you're dealing with. And this is the tier two anti-aircraft. For what it's worth, I mean, this is a tremendous, tremendously powerful anti-aircraft. It, it really can can tear down T1 quite effectively. I would say strategically, what I like to do with these is try and get them underneath an air screen, uh, like a fighter wall for the enemy. And then just leave it there and, and try to let it pick apart the enemy fighter screen uh, one shot at a time. And eventually their fighter screen will be so depleted without them even realizing why that you now suddenly have the opportunity to bomb or to use gunships or whatever whatever your play might be. Now moving on, we have the Negotiator, which is a stealthy rocket launcher, so it cannot be detected by radar. And it has a huge range to launch these missiles from. Uh, and you can see that it indeed launches tremendously huge missiles. Watch this bad boy collides with the ground here nice little explosion so very good very good option for harassing uh, the enemy from a long range if you're looking for that sort of ability it's a good unit to mix into your composition these missiles do enough damage to tear through t2 artillery units so any of the artillery in, in t2 and t1 are going to be devastated by this sort of thing so if you can figure out where those are and target them with missiles of course it's going to be extremely useful um, they're also they're also useful because you you know they're anti radar so you can sneak them up a little bit closer to the enemy lines without them being able to find exactly where they're launching missiles from, which is always a, a useful benefit. Now moving along, we have the anti radar and uh, radar bots, or the the radar and anti radar respectively. They provide a tremendous radar field. The the radar one does, of course, as well as a massive line of sight thing. So. These are, these are really critical if you're using artillery, especially the, the vehicle artillery, because they're going to give you the vision that you need in order to actually properly utilize the range that your units have. And the anti-radar, of course, just sort of the same thing. It jams the radar field around your units so that they don't get detected by enemy radar signatures, or rather by any enemy radar towers. Now, next up is a really, really fun unit. This is the Tsar. The Tsar Bomba. Uh, Russian heavy tank very heavy assault tank see it has a really huge range and that massive aoe radius when you fire this thing it lobs this giant projectile with a tremendous i mean just huge explosion what a what a devastating explosion um needless to say this thing destroys t1 and t2 and even t3 i mean this is just a powerhouse of a unit it really it really tears through anything with that massive projectile <coughs> excuse me it does the AOE damage to to deal with T1 swarm. It does the direct damage to deal with T2 health. Does same for for T3 units. So once you can start pumping these out, you're in a really good spot. And indeed, you're going to want to pump these out because they they are a, a fantastic addition to any army composition just for the raw damage output. Not to mention, of course, that they have 7,800 health, making them extremely tanky as well just on the top on top of that on at the face of it now next up we have the tremor which is a really interesting artillery device these need to be manually controlled which is something that i often see new players failing to achieve and the reason for that is their attack is quite bizarre if we turn this thing around you'll notice it looks like a calamity a miniaturized calamity if we if we just look at this it fires this volley of 
artillery projectiles and it fires like a hundred of them just super, super quickly. And the reason this has to be manually controlled is because it can only keep up this sustained rate of fire when it's told to attack a, a certain location, like a static location. If you have enemy units that are moving around and, and sort of juking and jiving, what you're going to see is this turret has to turn. You can see it has to turn and swivel its head and it's super slow. So if it has to like track these units all over the place, it's, it's going to have to turn its head like crazy, uh, meaning that its fire rate is going to be substantially cut down, which is, you know, the whole point of this unit is that it can lay out this crazy fire rate of artillery. So very important that when you're using these strategically, you need to, you need to control them manually and tell them where you want to devastate the battlefield. Um, but devastate the battlefield, they will, because there is just so much raw damage that comes out of these. Even though it's inaccurate, when you get two or three of them going together, there's just so much fire coming down that it can basically just dissuade an army from entering an area. That's where I like to use them. It's sort of as a, a, a checkpoint blocker, right? I would just put two or three of them across this, this little area right here. Just have them all firing into this zone. Oh, if I can get it to fire, there we go. And, you know, nobody's going to want to move into there, right? There's just this constant downpouring of artillery in this area. And so nobody's going to want to move their units through this area, especially when you get two or three or four of these. Um, now, these do come at a pretty tremendous cost. Uh, 1,850 metal, which is pretty high. Not, excuse me, not incredibly out of the ballpark of, of feasible once you get a, a T2 economy up and running, but definitely expensive for if you're transitioning out of the T1 economy. So think of these as sort of a, a, a middle to late tier two era siege unit. Now moving along, we have the T2 constructor, which of course just built all the T2 units. It's also you step into T3. Any of the T2 units can step into T3. Uh, it has all the, the regular T2 stuff, so we're, we're going to skip on past that. And we have the Banisher Missile, or the Banisher Heavy Missile Tank up next. This thing is interesting because it can technically attack anti-air with its missile, although it's not extremely effective. It, it fires this huge lobbed missile, uh, and it actually tracks too, so it can it can track enemies with the missile and it'll, it'll make sure that the missile lands in the right spot. This is a great uh, single, single target damage unit. These are great for bursting down really high health units. Um, a good counter for Zars or some of the other T3 units we'll get into later. I would say these are a good unit to mix into your, mix into your composition, but you have to use them sort of sparingly. You don't want to rely on them entirely, but you do want to make sure you have them because they're going to provide the single target damage to burst down anything big enough to threaten your other units. Uh, which you sort of desperately need because your other units are going to always be at risk of something bigger. Um, strategically speaking, they have a huge range, so you can use these to siege, but you can also just use them as sort of a backline unit that just supports whenever something dangerous gets close. That's that's kind of the role that I see them fitting into. Next up, we have the Tiger Tank, which is a heavy assault tank. It has this uh, double, double cannon design that shoots out these little plasma blasts. It's also extremely fast and relatively cheap meaning that you can produce these in, in pretty decent numbers and send them to the front. I like to use these as a harassment vehicle, just build up a mass of maybe five or 10 of them and send them past the enemy lines. And eventually they're gonna find something, some, some eco or some other delicious structure to destroy and soak their nasty fangs into. That being said, they can keep up with the other uh, assault tanks, the other, the other heavy tanks as well. Uh, you just have to make sure that you spread them out so that you mitigate AOE effects and you utilize their speed, right? You want to keep them moving constantly so that they're always a more difficult target to hit. Um, that being said, I I think that they're probably the most underwhelming of all these units. You know, they all kind of have these, these crazy high damage impact weapons. And this one is sort of, you know, sort of middle of the road. But that being said, there's there's something to be said for its general purpose use just as a frontline unit, a assault unit, a defensive unit. You're, they're, they're good for if your ally needs help and they need a, a T2 power spike help. Um, by that, I mean you're, you've gone to T2 and are producing T2 units, but your your enemy is still dealing with, or rather your teammate is still dealing with T1 units. They're a good option for that because they're fast enough to get there in time. And they're also inexpensive enough to, to not hamper your own success. Uh, moving along, we have the Quaker, which is a mobile artillery. Relatively cheap for, for a T2 unit, but it does a pretty good amount of damage, so... Kind of surprising how cheap these are and they they put out a nice little splash of damage they don't fire particularly fast but that's all right because you can build four or five of them and rain down artillery on your enemy you can see that it lets out this nice little 
artillery blast. Great for sieging, great for breaking front lines. Um, I would definitely include a few of these right next to the banishers, two or three of them. And then you have a really solid unit composition. In fact, I'm going to add that to my auto auto group for hotkey number two. Uh, by the way, in case you're curious about auto groups, you simply just hold alt and then select the unit. Rather, you select the unit and then hold alt. And then you press any number on your keyboard. And then it'll add it to the auto group. So you can see that one of the auto groups I have built is for all my sort of long range siege units. And I hit two and it selects all those. My tiger tank is considered a, a assault unit, which I have all my assault units on hotkey one. Um, and then other other stuff I have assigned to other hotkeys, but that's how you do that in case you're curious about that. Just a useful little tip for you. Now moving along, we have the anti-nuke. Now this is interesting because for Armada, it's a T2 bot lab that gives them the mobile anti-nuke. For Cortex, it is the T2 vehicle lab. So that's an important distinction to make. But you can see this thing produces a nice big yellow anti-nuke anti field. So any nuke that targets any area within this yellow circle is going to be shot down by the missile that pops out of this thing. Which is relatively important when you have a, a frontline composition that costs a lot of metal. You'd really hate for it to be blown away by a single nuke that targets the right area. So definitely put one of these in there and move it up to your front line just in case your enemy starts thinking about going nuclear to address the growing issue of your success. <laughs> now anyway, we're going to move back here and we're going to go take a look at some of the other bot labs. So our next segment we're going to be talking about is the T2 aircraft, or rather the, the T1 aircraft. I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to jump straight to T2. T1 aircraft. Welcome to the T1 aircraft section. Uh, first off, we have the Finch, which is right here. You can see it's a scout plane, so it has a little bit of a radar presence, uh, as well as a huge line of sight. Great for scouting out areas if you wanted to bomb them or just know what's going on with your enemy. Very important to know. Uh, next up, we have the Hercules, the transport. Uh, we've already seen this a little bit with the commando over there, but the Hercules is able to pick up light things and move them around. Things like construction turrets, things like um, light units, like T1 units, things like that. Uh, just a, a general pur purpose transport anytime you need to move things around. It can also pick up the commander, which is important to know. So if you want to move your commander to somewhere interesting, you can always pick him up with this and move him around. Uh, next up here, we have the constructor, um, which is just a T1 constructor. So we don't, you know, it's it's the same as all the other ones. It's just very, very fast, but very low build power. Um, so we're going to move on right along. We have the fighter, which is your standard fighter. These are what you're going to want to build air screens out of. Air screens, of course, just being you click on your air lab, your, your air factory. You right click somewhere. You hit P as in Penelope on the keyboard, and then you left click somewhere else and it produces a patrol point. And then you queue up these fighters on repeat. And what you get out of that is a wall of fighters moving back and forth in a, in a sort of oval pattern along this, along this ridge. And when you do that, you'll, you'll essentially have an effectively like self-recycling air defense that will protect your, your base from enemy bombing attacks and, and stuff like that. So really important to include these fighters. Um, that being said, you can also use them for you know shooting down anything. They're they're an air-to-air -air fighter, so they can only attack aircraft. Um, there there's no they have no attack for dealing with ground units. So keep that in mind, of course. But definitely an important unit and important to mix into your composition uh, if you do go for air. And your teammates will rely on you to have these so that you can attack the enemy bombers when they do come. If you're interested in how to bomb, check out my bombing tutorials. Those are also available on this uh, this this playlist, this t bar tutorials playlist. But anyway, the next step is the shuriken. And this is an interesting unit. We were talking about how, earlier we were talking about how the Cortex doesn't have a great option for paralysis. Well, that's sort of a half lie. The shuriken is actually an amazing option for paralysis. You can see it shoots out this little, little I don't know, little paralysis beam. <laughs> For lack of a better word. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can get it to target this here. Maybe I can't target friendly. Maybe I can target one of these windmills. We'll see. It fires this little paralysis beam, which isn't ex itself extremely powerful, but it's ex extremely cheap to produce these things. So what you end up seeing... Yeah, I guess it won't let me paralyze my own stuff. What a bummer. What you end up seeing is that these, these things, when you mass them, and they're only 58 metal to produce one of them, when you mass them, you can send them in these sort of hordes towards the enemy and they'll paralyze entire front lines, shutting them down completely. Uh, at which point your teammates or your own army can move in and effectively 
just brutalize that army. I mean, they can't fight back. So you're in a great position there. Now, as uh, as powerful as that may seem, they're also extremely light and, and extremely low health. So you have to be aware of anti-aircraft fire when you're using these things. Anti-aircraft of any scale, light anti-aircraft or otherwise, is going to tear these things apart very rapidly. So it's important that you don't clump them up. You always want to go into battle with them spread out. That way, a single blast doesn't take out 4, 5, 10, 20 of them as you, as you move them in. It also helps disperse the EMP effect so that more things are stunned at once. You don't just over-stun a single thing. Um, but I think that's about all for, for the Shuriken. It's a really interesting unit, and it's it's a good idea if you're going air and, and you've let your teammates know that you're going air. Maybe you're going bombing or something, and you've you've made your bombers, and you're, you're ready to make some sort of tech transition. You might want to squeeze out a few fighters and then a few Shuriken, maybe just 20 or so of them. And that's going to allow you to assist around the field while you're teching or, or building new bot lab or whatever it may be. And that's going to be, of course, immensely useful to your team. And they'll be very grateful that you're offering that assistance. So anyway, moving on to the, uh, the last unit here is the bomber, of course. And if you've checked out my bombing tutorial for Cortex, you've seen these before, but I'll go over them again. They drop, what is that? Five bombs, one, two, three, four, five, counting in a video. Very nice. You can see they drop five of these bombs, and they are a high impulse bomb, so they're pretty pretty high AOE in a nice little nice little range here. Uh, you can see that they also re reload relatively quickly, which is very nice. So you can use these things to harass, I mean, bases, front lines, anything like that, anywhere you need to bomb. Um, I've sort of covered the general strategy for these already, but the the idea is that you want to target things that chain react. So. Over here, if we look at this, for example, we can see these construction turrets would be a great target. Uh, the windmills would be a great target. In fact, let's let's do a bombing run right over here just to show you how devastating a single one of these bombers can be to a, a, a line of economy that's all chain reactive. There you go. You can see basically like most of this stuff was brought down to low health. If you had two bombers, it would all be dead, right? Second bombing pass is going to go down. Here's the windmills, and you can see the construction turrets are all beat up pretty badly as well. Probably going to finish them on maybe one more pass. Well, I guess there's too much healing there, but you get the idea. Two bombers, and you'd have that entire base wiped out in a single strafing single strafing run. Um, but that's that's kind of the idea behind the bombers. You want to target you want to target chain reactive structures, especially T1 Eco. You can also bruise a bunch of T1 solar panels, and they'll close up for a little while, denying your enemy a little bit of energy production, which can be very useful. Make them e-stall. Uh, and and aside from that, you can also drop them on on front lines, right? Like if there's a if the enemy is all organized into these nice neat rows, like I have for this demonstration, you can bomb across the row. So come in and and drop your bombs across rather than then, you know, in, in a in a straight on fashion, you drop them across this way. And that's going to give you a much better result because every one of your bombs is going to do damage opposed to, you know, maybe one or two landing on the intended target. Anyways, that's all for the T1 aircraft. Now we're going to move into the T2 aircraft. So for T2 aircraft, there's a lot to talk about because Cortex T2 aircraft are rather interesting. Not, not as... Um, strategically interesting as the uh the the t2 aircraft for armada I, I would say but they do have some interesting units that we're going to discuss right now so first up is the sky dragon kind of an interesting unit because it's the first sort of tanky air unit that we've seen so far uh, this thing has a laser attack in fact it has three of them and they can fire these lasers at a pretty decent range while they're hovering around in place really interesting use case for these because they're, they're strong enough that they can deal with most defenses. They can't really keep up with a fighter screen. Like they, those will tear them apart. But as long as there's not a big fighter screen and the, the anti-air defenses aren't too thick, these can be durable enough to sneak past or even just bold-faced walk past enemy defensive lines and go blow up a really important economy. I mean, these uh, these lasers do enough damage that they can they can easily blow up reactors um, and, and, and cause chain reactions. So sort of an interesting unit to build 10 or 15 of these and then go snipe economies in the back line of players. Definitely a valid option. You just have to make sure that you also accompany them with enough fighters to clear fighter screens or the uh, appropriate anti-air vehicles uh, or units provided by your teammates. 
Now, that being said, they're not a catch-all solution to every problem, but they are also really good against T3 units as well, like Titans, Juggernauts, any of the any of the T3 stuff, because those don't really have a great anti-air attack, meaning that what you can use with these things for is, is uh, five or ten of them surround one of those and, and basically burst them down one at a time. It's not a perfect solution, but it is pretty good and something to consider if you have a T2 economy and you're on T2 aircraft and you're not sure it's worth uh, switching into some other some other type of bot lab. Now, you just go chill out over here. And next up is the Condor. So the Condor is the advanced scout plane. It has sonar, it has radar, it has a huge line of sight. It's a tremendous scout plane and it's what you're going to want to switch to whenever you can afford it because they're going to be able to give you a much better scouting read without going down as easily as the tier 1 scouts. Now, there is something to be said for amassing a huge group of T1 scouts because those are going to burn through the anti-air defenses, the the missiles, the the long range anti-air defenses. Uh, much easier or, or rather in much greater number, right? So they're going to they're going to require a lot more shots the the T1 uh, scouts are. So if you're going to to choose something, either choose to make a few of these these T2 scouts or make an absolutely ludicrous amount of the T1 scouts because they're so cheap. That's that's my recommendation to you. Uh, obviously, the T1 scouts don't have sonar though, so that so that is uh, one benefit to going with this unit as opposed to anything else. Uh, up next, we have the Skyhook, which is the upgraded transport. Now, it doesn't have any sort of uh, any sort of armament like the Armada equivalent, but it can pick up much larger things. So it can pick up any of the bigger units. It can pick up laser turrets. It can pick up uh, well, kind of a kind of a whole host of different options. It can pick up any of the T2 stuff. I wonder if it can pick up any of this. It doesn't look like it. Can I pick up T3 units? No, it won't let me. So yeah, kind of a kind of a weird one because it doesn't really open that much more in terms of like how much more you can transport around, or rather the, the amount of things, the amount of different things that you can transport around. But it does allow you to pick up more things at once. So you can go pick up a whole group of units. Like if we just if we tell it to pick up everything in this circle, we'll see how many units it can pick up. But other than that, I mean they're you know they're kind of a niche unit. Like if you need to move things around to the front lines or otherwise, you can uh, you can do that and and you can use one of these things. But I think it's kind of a a bad option. Or otherwise, it's just it's just not a very necessary strategy. Um, so we picked up four of these light units. It's not terrible, but it's also not great. We'll tell it to unload over here and we'll just let it do it let it do its thing that's right you have to turn repeat on in order for it to unload properly important to know for microing those things you do have to turn repeat on in order for those commands to be issued multiple times otherwise it's just going to leave it's just going to drop one unit and that's not usually what you're looking for Anyway, moving on to the next unit here, we have the Torpedo Bomber, which is interesting, very useful. If you have a player that's playing C, they're going to be extremely grateful if you offer them a few of these tor Torpedo Bombers, because they can do a really, really tremendous amount of damage um, without any way for the enemy to harass them. So these drop, these ones drop three torpedoes, which is a, you know, it's it's not tremendous, but if you, if you build enough of these, it's enough to... Um, to really, really devastate an enemy navy that does not have any anti-air uh, ships in their in their arsenal. So it's a great option for that. It's it's basically, I mean, that's its purpose, right? It's very purpose designed. It's it's for fighting naval ships and and destroying submarines or, or boats or whatever that don't have any anti-aircraft protection capabilities. So I would definitely recommend if you go anti-aircraft, send a few of these. Either give them to your teammate that's playing navy, or just use them while you're while you're just micro them while you're having something else queued up because they'll produce enough damage at a, at a significant enough rate that it can really turn the tide in a t2 naval battle moving along we have the t2 constructor again very similar to the other t2 constructors you can step up to t3 you can build all the t2 stuff we're going to skip that one we have the nighthawk which is the fighter plane the t2 fighter plane and like i said for armada as soon as you can build these things you basically want to switch to them they're they're higher dps they have higher health they can fire a bit faster all, all around they're just a, a better option as far as building fighter screens and and you know fighter contingents for escorting bombers all that sort of stuff 
they're, they're just a better option. So as soon as you have the economy to do so, you really want to switch into producing these instead of producing the T1 aircraft. And what I like to do if I don't want to destroy, if I don't want to dismantle my, my T1 aircraft, um, which you can do, by the way, at a full cost. This was, this was something somebody was asking about. If you hit E to reclaim, your, your reclaim button down here, you can click on your own structures to pick them up and, and, and gobble them up. And you can see you you would get 840 metal out of this, which, you know, I'm already full of metal, so I can't really, couldn't really show you that. But you get a full refund of all the metal that was in that structure when you refund something. But anyway, if you don't feel like doing that, you can still produce the T1 scouts, the finches, and still have enough of a, a, uh, a wall that can soak up the long-range anti-air and also scout for you while you produce the T2 fighters. So that's that's kind of a good option if you're uh, you're, you're you're not ready to commit to all the T2 stuff, but you want to get a T2 fighter screen up, in, up and running. Next up, we have the Wasp, which is a gunship. It's the first gunship that uh, Cortex has access to. And you can see it fires these sort of missiles. I love the design of this thing. It's a little Apache helicopter looking, looking aircraft. And it fires these missiles with a pretty good AOE on them, actually. Uh, this is a great option for if you're looking for something for base defense. They can really tear apart T1 pushes really easily. Um, but in, in a big swarm, they can also do enough damage to bring down T2 and T3 units as well. So definitely, if you're looking for some sort of option, I wouldn't really use these offensively unless I know for a fact that their fighter screen is taking down and there's an area where there's no anti-air defenses. Because they are sort of paper thin to anti-air defense and will will just fall apart. And so that's a lot of metal to put into something just to be wasted on getting torn down by anti-air. So I would definitely keep a bunch of these around for a for defensive reasons in, in case a line gets broken and you need to go clean something up. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend pushing with them unless you're absolutely sure that you have uh, air superiority in that area. And finally, the last but certainly not least is the Hailstorm, the heavy strategic bomber. Um, heavy couldn't be more of more of the correct term for for this bomber. You can see the AOE on the bombs that this thing drops are just I mean, it's huge. It's massive impulse warheads, um, and they're just devastating. You can tear down Aphis with just like five or ten of these things. I think it's probably eight you would need to, to destroy an advanced fusion reactor. But you can see that those bombs are just devastating. There's also a huge overlap in the bombs, so they, they really do target a pretty specific area pretty well, which is something that the bombers sort of struggle with generally. Now, I would recommend this in case you're looking to bomb. Uh, remember that you do need fewer of these because they're tougher and they do more damage, so the ratios are quite different. But essentially, one of these is going to be able to tear apart T1 Eco with no problem. Four or five of these is going to be able to tear through the, the fusion reactors and the, um, the energy converters. I mean, one of these will destroy energy converters, but five of them will probably tear through a fusion reactor pretty well. And then maybe eight of them would tear through an advanced fusion reactor with, with relative ease. So keep those numbers in mind when you're deciding how many you want to build because they are a little bit expensive at 310 metal. But for, for the cost that you pay compared to the damage that you can do, they can be extremely efficient on the battlefield. Certainly that's where I get most of my efficiency rewards from for, for being you know the most damage efficient player on the field. It's from when I do bombing and I manage to blow up entire economies using just a couple, you know maybe a thousand or so metal worth of bombers. Anyway, that is the T2 aircraft. And so we're going to be moving on to a completely different era Completely different, different part of the the world. We're going to be moving on to the hovercraft. Now, pardon me for a second. I must have forgotten to organize these, but luckily there's not too many, so it shouldn't be too hard to distinguish them properly. Now, first up on our list, we have the what is this called? The Bird Eater. Interesting. So the Bird Eater is an anti-air hovercraft. Sort of your your anti-air option for if you're going hovercraft is is the Bird Eater. That was sort of sort of a redundant sentence, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, this fires a little little missile. Uh, tremendous range on it, actually. I don't use aircraft, or rather the hovercraft, very often, but it does fire a little little anti-air missile that can tear down these uh, the the aircraft with ease. Any any role that could be filled by an anti-aircraft is where this fits in. Uh, it just has the benefit of being able to go over the land or over the sea. So the T1 anti-aircraft isn't very astonishing. It's not it's not very good for the, the naval regions. So maybe if you're considering supporting a naval player, build a few of these anti-aircraft hovercraft and send them to them because they'll be a little bit more effective at clearing the aircraft harassment off of the ships. 
Uh, next up, we have the caiman, which is a type of type of uh, crocodilian species, reptilian sort of thing. The the actual animal, I mean. This this of course is just a tank. But you can see it sort of lobs this projectile, and a lot of these units have a lot of similarities between the uh, these units and the the vehicles. You can see they sort of follow similar trajectories, but are just in a hovercraft variant. And of course, the hovercraft specialty means that they can go over the the ocean as well as the land um, with with no traversal penalty. So that being said, this is a good option for if you're looking for something a little bit tankier, does a lot of DPS, good for generally just pushing through these um, pushing through defensive lines. The the benefit to hovercraft in the ocean is that they cannot be targeted by torpedoes. So if the enemy has a lot of the torpedo defenses, the the urchins, I believe they're called, you can walk these tanks or, or float these tanks, I guess, rather. Hover these tanks. That's probably the right word. There we go. You can hover these tanks over to the, uh, the defenses and pick them apart without risking your own army, which, of course, is extremely nice. And uh, also beneficial to a Navy player, right? If you're if you're helping a Navy player or you are the Navy player and you just happen to have a hovercraft platform up, say you're playing Supreme Straits using my guide to Supreme Straits, in case you're curious, uh, you you can use these uh, these these hovercraft to tear down early defenses without risking your own naval units in the process, which of course is extremely powerful. Moving along, we have the mongrel or Mon mongadel. I've never seen that word before. Anyway, it's an aircraft rocket launcher, and indeed, this is the fastest way to get rockets. The uh, Armada faction has a similar rocket launcher, so they can also uh, they can also get these rockets as well. But the the idea here is that this you can build these things if you have the aircraft, or rather, the hovercraft platform, and give them to to players that are fighting extended front lines. And these rockets are very, very high damage. So you can you can launch these things and send them into static defenses, light laser turrets, that sort of thing, and blow them apart with relative ease. I think it takes three missiles to blow apart a single um, a single LLT light laser turret. I could be wrong about that though for the the numbers on the Cortex one. Somebody will have to have to let me know in the comments. It looks like a slightly bigger explosion than the Armada variant, so I wonder if there's these are a little more powerful. Uh, that being said, your teammates are going to be extremely grateful for you sending these to them because uh, they, they can they can put out a lot of long range damage and also from interesting positions, right? Because they lob this missile up in the air, they can harass from areas where otherwise units wouldn't necessarily be able to go, especially if it's a, a water based area as well. So we're going to step into the next one here, which is the Halberd, which is a heavy assault tank. Again, we're we're doing laser weapons for the uh, the Cortex, which is cool. Um, they're they're always keen to throw lasers on whatever they can, and wow, that was pretty loud. the The Halberd assault hover tank sort of is the the good the good compromise between a um, stepping up into tier two of of any caliber and staying in T one, because of course there's no T two hovercraft. Uh, at least not yet, anyway. I don't know if they plan to add that or, or what, but uh, there, there is no T2 hovercraft currently. So this is probably the, the highest end unit that you're going to build before you want to start transitioning out of T1. So if you're looking to support a, a unit base that is slowly moving towards Tier 2, this is a good option because it provides a lot of DPS. It is relatively low ranged, so you, you do have to get these pretty close, get them in there. Um, it's also relatively fast too, so it can it can traverse with enough speed to be lethal enough while also maintaining its mobility. Now, speaking of mobility, uh, we're gonna skip the constructor because it's just the same as T1 constructors. It can just do everything that a naval constructor or a vehicle constructor can do. We're gonna go to the goon, which is the fast attack hovercraft. You can see this thing is extremely speedy, has a very light laser attack, just fires off. Uh, these are harassment harassment vehicle, of course. They're one of the fastest early game vehicles that you can create. Very, very comparable to the Armada Seeker, I believe it's called, which is a which is sort of the same thing. It's a hovercraft with a little laser on it. I like to use these early on as a harassment because they're so damn quick that they can move past enemy defenses as well as uh, evade enemy units that are sort of chasing them. You can see when we get on a land, it gets a little bit slower because it's a, a bit of an uphill here, but it's still extremely fast, and we can move this thing super far in, um, and it's going to be able to 
it's going to be able to do a, a, a good amount of work getting in, into the enemy's back line and, and tearing apart their mechs, all that sort of good stuff. Now, that's it for the hovercraft. So what we're going to look at next is the uh, naval craft. I'm going to stop this bomber real quick so it's not making too much noise. Stop this as well. There we go. Okay. So starting with Tier 1 Naval. This is the Tier 1 Naval section. We have a few options for you here. The first up being the Orca Submarine. This is your first submersible craft, and it's the first time... Well, actually, it's not because of the duck, but take a look at this cursor up in its little card here. You can see that it's blue, which basically means that it's a naval... It can attack anything in the, anything in the water. Uh, it fires a little torpedo, and these are an, an essential part of any naval composition. When you're building a naval army... You really want a big mix of units to handle all the different scenarios. So we've spotted the enemy AI somewhere over here. Important to note for the future. When you're building a composition of naval craft, you want to make sure that you cover all your different bases. So you want these, these uh, missile corvettes for anti-air. You're going to want some assault frigates to do DPS. You're going to want destroyers. You're going to want light gunboats. And we'll cover all of these, but individually, each one of these doesn't have enough power to contest the ocean alone. Or rather, if you if you amass any one of these units, just just mass produce them, you're you're always going to have some weakness that your enemy is going to be able to exploit. So, for submarines, that's going to be destroyers because the destroyer's depth charge launcher can easily just can I mean it can easily t tear these things apart, but also it can it can attack and and seek from a distance. So the the problem that you run into is that these submarines have to be facing a certain way in order to attack. For instance, if we tell it to attack here, it has to turn around. Here, it has to you know has to turn, and that's uh you know that's that that means that if these destroyers get behind your submarines, your submarines are going to be extremely vulnerable to the depth charge launchers. So that being said, your submarines are a substantial damage output for your navy. So you do need them, and you, you need a lot of them, because their torpedoes are going to be able to sink boats a lot faster than the cannons would on the, the ships. So that's the role that they fill. They're an underwater damage per second unit uh, that can also tear apart enemy submarine lines, which is also just as important, because you need to be able to uh, damage those so that your own ships aren't vulnerable. Next up, we have the Herring, which is a missile, cor missile corvette. So it fires this... Uh, fires this little light missile out that tracks enemy units, but it also can shoot down aircraft, which is really important. This is your, your anti-aircraft option for uh, Cortex. Now, when you're when you're dealing with anti-aircraft, you're gonna need a lot of these because their anti-aircraft capabilities are, are fairly weak. So it's important to mix in quite a few of these, but the other interesting thing that they have is sonar, which allows your submarines to attack before, your, uh, before the enemy submarines actually get in range meaning that you actually have a little bit more time to attack the submarines. And with how fragile submarines can be, it's important that you win the first hit uh, it, rather than letting your opponent get it, of course. So these can be thought of as, you know, all these and more. The, they're a missile corvette, they're anti-air, they're sonar, but also they're a distraction, right? You can use these to make the enemy submarines fire at something that is relatively low cost and doesn't really matter much. Uh, and, and what that means is that your submarines are going to win the fight that actually matters, which is the underwater one. Now, moving along, we have the destroyer. The destroyer has a whole host of weapons. Of course, in uh, true, our, uh, true, true Cortex fashion, it's got these big, heavy artillery guns that do a, a tremendous amount of damage. It also has a depth charge launcher, which you can see there on the front of it. Um, and this is a this is sort of your general purpose contest ship. Like this is what you use to to dominate the seas with. The long range, the long range cannons on this can fire away at coastal fortifications, so sort of uh, emplacements, but it can also fire away at torpedo launchers, the the naval defensive structures, which I'll show you right now. The urchin, which is this sort of uh, sort of defensive structure. I'll start building one so you can actually take a look at it. But you can see the range on the the torpedo launcher is 500, whereas the range on the destroyer is 710. So that's kind of one of the other uses is that these things, the destroyers rather, can tear apart these urchins and, and any other static defense with relative ease with those huge artillery guns. That being said, these guns are very, very big and very slow, which is why you need this next unit, the Riptide. So the Riptide is an assault unit, which means that it just fires fast and it does a lot of damage. It's basically just raw DPS in a, in a big package. Um, this thing does not have any sort of anti 
anti underwater attack though, which is why it's important that you bring this thing in contingents with submarines, destroyers, anything anything that you can get your hands on to attack underwater. Um, so this is the torpedo launcher, by the way. And you can see it just fires these little torpedoes relatively quickly. Important to build these because they 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 can tear apart ships pretty quickly. Um, so the Riptide, it's 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 got a lot of damage and it's relatively quick for a boat, um, but it's it's definitely should be considered more of a support vessel, right? Like it's it's what you need when you need more damage per second and you need a more consistent stream of damage per second, but you already have the underwater supremacy, right? Because you don't want to build these if your enemy has masses of submarines. Because those submarines are going to tear this apart and there's nothing you can do. So what you need to do when you're building these is basically build a composition. So what I like to do when I'm queuing up these is literally just tap all three of these. Um, and then the anti-aircraft as well. And hit it on repeat. And that way, you know, I'm going to, I know that I'm going to have a mix. And then I tweak this slight, slightly based on what my enemy is doing. So, oh, my enemy's going heavy into riptides. Maybe I'll do less destroyers and another submarine, right? Because the submarines counter the riptides. Oh, they've stopped making... Riptides are now only making destroyers. Okay, well, I'm just going to make a uh, whole fleet of, of Riptides and and uh, Riptides and assault, uh, d you know, uh, destroyers, assault frigates, and, and herrings and whatever. And I'll just I'll just outrange them and outpace them. Um, and then the other unit that you can use is the the gunboat, which is, of course, uh, we'll we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, now you have a, a death cavalry, which is such a cool name, by the way. This is your resurrection submarine. So very similar to the T1 bot, the Grave Robber. This thing can resurrect corpses of ships that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean and can refloat them. Uh, and you can reincorporate them back into your army, which is of course wonderful. You can also use these to, you can also use these to, uh, sorry about the camera there, I was just checking something. You can always use these to repair as well if you hit E, uh, sorry, if you hit R to repair. You can repair everything in a certain circle and it'll, it'll go around and it'll patch all these things up at no cost. Uh, most importantly though, these can be used to reclaim wrecks that are left on the ocean floor. So if for instance, we tell this thing to attack this, can we get it to do it? Uh, I won't do it. Well, say for instance that you had a, uh, you had some sort of some sort of wreck on the ocean floor, either from combat or mechs or whatever it may be, you can use this thing to go reclaim that. And that's really important because metal is very exhausted. Um, in other words, you use a lot of metal when you build Navy. So you have to make sure that you're reclaiming as much as possible. So these are actually a really important part of building up a naval composition. Now the gunboat is the last unit and it is a very light harassment unit that you can build. You can see it has these twin laser turrets which are kind of cool. Again, using lasers wherever they can. It's the Cortex motto. Uh, these are these are a light harassment units, but also they're a great stalker unit. Um, and what I mean by that is you can use them to spy on enemy ships by getting them close enough to to see what they're doing, without you without losing the without well, without losing them and without losing the 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 sight line of them. Um, so you can use these to track your enemy's movements as long as your micro is good. And then from there, you know, you, you can see exactly what your enemy is doing and you know how to position your ships and, and where exactly you need to position them. The, the other tip I have for these is that you can see that these, uh, these laser turrets are in line. So you, whenever you can, you want to use the broadside of this ship because it'll fire a little, a little better. Now that's the end of the T1 shipyard. We're going to move along to T2 ships, T2 Navy. So start, oh, sorry, everybody up here. Chill out. Okay, so tier two Navy. We have the fast assault submarine. This is your bread and butter underwater attack vessel. It fires this sort of uh, low, well, low damage, quote unquote low damage. It's low damage for some of the other options here, but it, it's a relatively fast torpedo and it fires quite a few of them. It's a great option for mixing in to build a fleet up. It's definitely the probably one of the best ways to gain naval supremacy, but it's, also relatively fragile compared to some of the other units here. So you have to make sure that you support these again with the unit composition. I, I can't stress enough how important the unit composition is to the, the, the naval fleets. Next up, we have the Kraken, which is a long range battle submarine. And it has a, I mean, a long range, who would have guessed? It fires this uh, 
sort of seemingly innocent looking torpedo. But that torpedo actually does a tremendous amount of damage. It's, it's an incredibly high damage attack. Uh, you can see the burst damage is 1650. So these are going to tear through enemy units extremely quickly. And so you use these the same way that you would use a, uh, a single target high damage unit. You can use them to burst down high health units, or you can use them to strategically pick off specific units that you want to remove from your enemy's composition. Things like the anti-aircraft ship. So the Aerostorm is your, your T2 anti-aircraft ship, and it's quite a jump in price from the T1 anti-aircraft, but quite worth it. It has the bird shot on it, which is a flat cannon, so it'll tear down T1 units with relative ease. It also has two missile launchers to track enemy fighters and other stuff that are moving around really quickly. So you this is a this is essential for any of these compositions because any of these ships can be harassed by a, a gunship or a bomber or anything like that. So you need these anti-aircraft ships in here in order to, to stop that kind of harassment and prevent your ships from essentially being wasted. Next up, we have the anti-aircraft carrier. <laughs> I said that on the Armada and I said it here again. It is the aircraft carrier with anti-nuke. I'm just conjoining a bunch of different, different uh, roles that this thing plays. So uh, it is an aircraft carrier, which basically means if you have any aircraft, they'll land on it and get repaired. That's kind of a, a less important reason to build this thing. The more important being that it's an anti-nuke platform. So you can see it actually has a little prevailer on it there. But if anywhere inside of this massive yellow circle is targeted by a nuclear missile, it'll send out a its own little counter missile and detonate it midair so that it doesn't hurt anybody. Now this is pretty important because obviously all of your ships are going to be prone to a nuclear strike because they're all going to be organized in some sort of formation and the enemy is looking at that and thinking, okay, well, this is a great opportunity to just blow up the entire Navy with a single strike. So I 100% have to recommend that you build one of these things and keep it somewhere near your outward Navy. Of course, I would also recommend you keep one of these near your base as well so that doesn't get nuclear striked. But that's the, the beauty of these things is that they're mobile so you can keep them around and... and uh, move them wherever you see fit. Next up is a radar jammer ship, which is relatively self-explanatory. It masks the radar presence of your entire fleet everywhere within this this red circle here, um, which for Navy is actually tremendously large. You can you can fit a lot of ships within this circle, and especially if you chain together two or three of these radar ships, only 120 metal, so relatively low cost to uh, to build these things, and you can hide a tremendous fleet uh, from Navy naval detection. Now, that being said, that does not protect you from line of sight protection, which a lot of times your enemy will have. So you, you can't rely on this to completely mask your presence. But it is good for if you need to move your Navy around and you don't want it to accidentally be spotted by something, just a, a lone radar ping somewhere in the distance. Next up, we have the Despot, which is a battleship. Kind of an interesting interesting ship here. It has a big artillery cannon, that the three-headed cannon up on top uh, up there. But it also has a energy cannon on, on the side as well. So if we tell this thing to attack, you can see it fires a artillery blast and it also fires this energy blast. A interesting weapon because it can siege land defenses with relative ease because of that huge plasma artillery. It can contest lighter craft like gunboats and, and stuff like that because of the energy weapon essentially making it a really good option for if you need to deal with a enemy who's making a lot of spam units just sort of overwhelming you with harassment that being said that strategy isn't a, it's especially effective in naval warfare so it's probably not very common that you're going to see that so for that reason these things are typically used as basically just a damage output that you can, you can plug into your composition and then you suddenly have a tremendous amount more damage per second coming out of your Navy. Now moving along, everyone's favorite, Black Hydra. This is essentially just a big brother to the Despot. You can see it's a, it's got a huge artillery gun on its head. It's got three of those energy lasers instead of just one. And I believe it also has, yeah, some pop-up rapid fire ground to air missile launchers. So it also has an anti-aircraft attack. Although not nearly as powerful as the Aerostorm, it is enough to get light harassment uh, out of the way of this ship. Now you can see this artillery gun can fire tremendously far away. These the This thing can just lob these projectiles like crazy. This is a, uh, a great siege weapon for if you need to break a, a fortified position on land, but you don't have a great way to do it. This is one option. Of course, it's extremely expensive, 18,000 metal. 
but it's a it's a good move for especially maps like this where you know the enemy is going to be having bases all up here that you can just move your ship up to the the coast and start laying siege practically for free now that being said these are relatively expensive to produce and and uh you know, once once they're out, they need to be protected because they don't have any anti underwater attacks, meaning that you need to protect them with a contingent of submarines or or cruisers or something else that can can essentially protect them from submarines. Now, moving on, we have the T2 underwater constructor, mostly the same as the other T2 constructors, except that it can build underwater reactors and advanced energy converters for the Navy also build these underwater advanced metal extractors uh, i think i said metal extractors twice this is it's an advanced energy converter and a naval fusion reactor and a advanced metal extractor it can also build a whole host of different defenses like this devastator which is a big uh, multi-weapon platform and indeed it has an array of different weapons that it can use to attack different targets it can also build these advanced torpedo launchers which are an extremely extremely powerful torpedo launcher um, these things are capable of bringing down even black hydras if you build enough of them. So they're they're an extremely powerful defense. I, I can't overstate how powerful these things are. We also have the naval engineer, the Pathfinder. Uh, sort of an interesting one. It can build a, a lot of these defensive structures and, and other stuff like that. It can build these floating mines. Uh, but other than that, usually these are just used as, as mobile build power for these Tech 2 constructors, which are... Uh, otherwise, the main thing that you're going to be focusing on as far as construction goes. Now, next up, we have the cruiser, which is a, uh, a support vessel, I guess I would call it. It's got two energy weapons up top. It's got a, a uh, depth charge launcher, which we just saw there. Let's see it sort of coming out of nowhere. I don't actually see the depth charge launcher. Kind of odd. But anyway, you can see it's also got these, these two arrays of laser turrets. It's got... Excuse me. It's got these uh, heavy lasers on top of it. It's got light lasers down below and a depth charge launcher. So this is really what you want to use to keep gunboats and other distractions away from your Black Hydras, your despots, your anti-aircraft, or rather your, your anti-nuke and aircraft carrier. This is the, the catch-all sort of does everything ship. And it comes at the cost of being relatively, relatively light. A uh, thousand metal, you get five thousand six hundred hit points for it, which isn't hilariously bad. It it can hold its own, but it definitely needs to be included in a composition because its depth charge launcher isn't enough to deal with mass submarines. Its uh, its lasers aren't enough to deal with mass mass battleships or something like that. It's it's a great support vessel to include in a in a contingent, but it's not enough to build on its own. So for that reason, I would say mix it with some some assault submarines, mix it with some long range battle submarines, mix it in with a anti-aircraft. And then you've basically got a composition that can mobile, it's mobile enough, fast enough to contest the waters, but also strong enough to deal with any T2 threats. Now moving along, we have the, the final ship and probably my favorite, the Messenger, which is a cruise missile ship. See the radius on this thing is huge. And much like the Armada equivalent, it fires a, it opens up its little silo here. And it fires a big missile, just a, a huge arced missile that explodes into a bunch of little projectiles and peppers the ground all in that area. This is a great option for clearing out T1 defensive structures because a lot of the time they're going to be grouped up. All the, the LLTs and stuff are going to be grouped in little clusters. So if you want to get rid of those really easily, this is a great option because one, it can shoot over mountain ranges and whatnot because the missile arcs way up in the air. But also because it's just a, uh, it's it's got enough damage that it can really really put those those towers and whatnot out of commission. You can see you can really make this missile go pretty high up in the air if you get it close enough to whatever target you're aiming for. So wherever you need to siege land, this is kind of where you want to do it. Uh, of course, it's also effective against naval stuff as well. If you need to siege a naval base, uh, you just want to make sure that these are in your back line because they're completely defenseless on their own. That being said, they do have an, another light anti-air attack as well. They have they have a slight battery of missiles, tiny little tiny little battery of missiles that can attack any ships that are harassing, but not enough to stop a whole horde of gunships or anything like that. For that, you're definitely going to need some anti-air dedicated ships. Now, that's all for the T2 Navy. And with that, we're concluding everything except 
for the final big bads, the T3. So for the T3 experimental gantry, a lot of fun stuff to pick from here. First up, we have the behemoth. What a monstrous unit. You can see this thing is called the parentheses barely mobile heavy turret. Uh, and barely mobile heavy turret is right. I mean, look how it's just incredibly slowly this thing moves. Super, super slow. But its gun, just devastating. Shoots out this massive cannon. And you can see that thing is, I mean, it looks like a D-gun. It's, it's super, super powerful. Uh, these things are the wall breakers. These are the, these are the tie breakers. These are what you use when the enemy has turtled so heavily that you need something that can survive everything else and puts out enough damage to bring down even the biggest, baddest units. That's where this guy comes in because it's attack. Yeah, you notice it's an AOE attack. So it does everything in that line gets damaged. So when you shoot this thing and there's a bunch of units in front of it, all those units go away. It's, it's a fun little magic trick where this thing makes every unit in front of it disappear. Uh, alongside that, of course, it has those light lasers, which do a pretty good amount of damage as well. They're, they're not light laser turret lasers. They're, they're, they actually do high damage. Um, so, so this thing alone can basically break any fortified position short of just, I mean, an, an, a ridiculous amount of fortification, tier, tier two fortification. Uh, you, you need tachyons, you need, uh, you need pit bulls, you need sabo turrets, you need everything in the book in order to stop one of these from marching straight through whatever defenses you build. If you manage to get one of these things out on the field, make sure that you provide it with a ample supply of cheap light units surrounding it, like grunts or pawns or ticks or whatever, whatever unit you happen to be able to produce. Because if an enemy commander sees one of these on the field, it's an immediate call to degun it. Because it's really the only thing that can destroy this thing in any reasonable amount of time. So as long as you have those light units around it, they'll be able to detect the commander. And it'll be able to destroy the commander before it gets close enough to destroy the behemoth. Now moving along, we have the cataphract. Which is probably my favorite laser, or probably my favorite hover tank in the entire, the entire uh, game. It has a it hovers of course and it has depth charge launchers so it's it's pretty good against uh, against navy if you want to use these to break a tie against navy but my my favorite part about it of course is its main weapon with this massive green laser which just I mean tell me that isn't a uh, isn't a tank from Halo you know one of those uh, one of those uh, wraith tanks or maybe it's maybe it's a tank from Star Wars the uh, the the CIS tanks yeah just a just an epic epic unit fires such a cool laser beam also the only like sustained laser beam uh, weapon that cortex has at least that i can remember so if you're looking for for something to burn down really tanky units this is actually a really good option just because of their main attack uh now moving along we'll move into the second row of units here we have the catapult which is a heavy rocket bot and it has the interesting ability to be able to put rockets in any area um, that you need them <laughs> and a lot of them, a lot of rockets. And you can see with just one attack, it has managed to, uh, it has managed to devastate all of these T1 vehicles. I mean, they're all at 1%, 5%, like just, just tore them apart with a single barrage of those rockets. You can also see, of course, that these rockets can fly super, super far away. So you can shoot these things all over the place. Meaning that this thing, I mean, it's 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 the ultimate siege weapon, right? Like, you use this thing to clear out massive hordes of T1. You use this thing to break entrenched positions. You you can use this thing all over the place, and all of those rockets do a huge amount of damage. Definitely, definitely an interesting and important part of a late-game Cortex composition. Next up, we have the Karganath, which is a name borrowed from another game, or you, uh, also used in another game for, for this unit here, which we'll get to eventually. The Garganath is an all-terrain spider, meaning that it can climb all over all these walls and whatnot. But it also has this interesting missile attack. It, it shoots these missiles, which alone aren't super impressive. They don't do a tremendous amount of damage. But you get two or three of these Karganaths together, and these missiles can actually burn things down relatively quickly. Uh, just, just an impressive unit, but also it can be it can be extremely devastating when you build up a whole mass of them and send them towards a base because there's not a lot that T1 can do because these missiles are seeking and they're they're just enough damage to burn down those T1 units quick enough just a just a really good all-around unit for for assault 
I would say that it definitely earns its assault spider name very, very, very well. Now, next up is probably the most common T3 unit that you'll see, the Shiva. Now, the Shiva is a, is an extremely interesting unit. It, it serves a lot of interesting roles. It's amphibious, so it can walk underwater. It has this massive attack with these huge plasma cannons, and it also opens up to launch missiles out of its uh, rear, rear quarters, we'll call it. <laughs> you can see that this thing puts out a tremendous amount of firepower in, in just one area. So you, you can use these things to break front lines and you can use them to completely devastate T1 or T2 units. They they tear them apart with ease, making sure making very short work of anything with with you know, even a medium amount of health, right? Like they just they it's so much damage and such a compact package. Definitely a very, very good unit. And once you get up to T3 and you're looking for a unit to build, I would definitely say that's a great place to start. Start with those, start with Karganaths, start with catapults. And eventually, you're going to want to head to the final unit, both of this coverage and of the game most of the time, the Juggernaut. Yeah, this, this is an epic unit. I mean, if we zoom in close and listen. Why don't we pause the music? Boof. Boof. You can hear it. You can hear those footsteps echoing away. Just, just tremendously, tremendously... Uh, Un uninviting unencouraging <laughs> when you when you hear those things starting to move towards you you uh you know that you're in a whole heap of trouble and nothing short of a d-gun will basically stop this thing you're going to need a tremendous amount of firepower to bring one of these bad boys down as far as attacks go they've got plenty they've got a shotgun blast they've got a laser missile and they've got a they've got a they've got a uh Oh, I said a laser missile. They have a laser blast and a missile. <laughs> I was wondering. I was like, wait, there's three attacks, and I can't, I can't remember what the third one is. Yeah, they've got they've got tons of different stuff that they can do. Out of each of these tubes, they can launch missiles to siege bases from far away. Out of its head, it can fire a massive heat ray laser, and out of each of its arms, it can fire a spread of different projectiles, or, or rather the same projectile, but it can fire a big spread of them in a big shotgun blast. This is the end of the game unit. This is what you use to stop a game from going on. This is when you politely tap your enemy on the on the shoulder and say, excuse me, it's time for you to get out of my game. I'm ready for you to leave now. And so indeed this thing is what you would what you would most likely want to uh, want to aspire to creating. If, if there's any if there's ever a unit that you want to eventually get to, want to set your eyes on, this is the unit because this unit is hard to lose a game with. You really, you really have to work hard in order to lose a game once you have juggernauts out on the field. <laughs> um, that being said, of course, they are prone to being surrounded, right? Like they, you, you can, you can overrun them, and tachyon turrets are powerful. You can, you can overwhelm them with those, but eventually, you know, the juggernaut is going to make it through to the base, especially if you manage to get a juggernaut and a uh, a behemoth out and they don't both get degunned in the same blast, it's a dangerous composition to mix these two together and definitely something something that you would end the game with. Now, that wraps up all of the units for the Cortex list. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, or any concerns, or more importantly, have any insight about any of these units, I'll iterate once again for anybody who might have been skipping around. I am not a pro at Cortex. I play primarily Armada. If you have any insights into the Cortex kit and you would like to share them with me, uh, please do so in the comments because I would love for others to, to gleam some of that knowledge as well. That's the whole purpose of these videos. And it would really benefit me to have you guys, you, you lovely people, help me out and, and uh, help me figure out exactly what these uh, units do and, and, and how to use them. Help, help your fellow community members out, your fellow Brightworks community members out. And, uh, and let them know if there's anything that I've missed. Uh, also, please, please, please consider subscribing. Uh, we've hit now, I believe it was 89 subscribers, which is, I mean, just absolutely phenomenal. I, I really, I really couldn't even have asked for so much, so much love and support. And, uh, you know, it really makes me feel like a lot of people are interested in these videos and it, it makes me want to do them all that much more. So, uh, with, with that in mind, I guess that'll be all in this edition of the, uh, in this edition of the Unit Thesaurus. I hope you enjoyed and I hope this helps. I'll see you all in the next one.